Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm here. Thank you for your patience. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. Well, let's go live then. Madam Chairman, we're live. All righty, committee members, we're live. Today is Monday, January 24th. It's 8.30 a.m. And um, thank you for the virtual, uh, being part of the virtual meeting of the Joint Travel, Recreation, Wildlife, and Cultural Resources Committee. We're going to kick off this meeting with a roll call. Good morning, Madam Chairman. Senator Guru. Here. Senator Landon. Here. Senator Salazar. Here. Senator Schuler. Here. Representative Banks. Here. Representative Haroldson. Here. Representative Hunt. Excused. That, that, that you need to change that. Representative Jennings. Here. Representative Knapp. Here. Representative Newsom. Here. Representative Sweeney. Here. Representative Winter. Here. Representative Williams. Here. Co-Chairman Ellis. Here. Co-Chairman Flitner. Here. Madam Chairman, you have a quorum. All righty, thank you, um, LSO. And with that, the first item on our agenda is an update on Wyoming State Tourism. First, we'll hear from an update on the subcommittee of the Capital Interpretive Plan and Wayfinding um, under the title Visitation of the Wyoming Capital. With that, I yield to Senator Landon for an update. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, as many of you know, we have spent this past interim uh, working on an effort to finish up um, the renovation of our state capitol. Um, back when, when we opened the doors, we knew that we had to do that. Um, and what we call that is wayfinding. But we have also uh, concentrated on everything else that we should at least consider uh, doing. Uh, I'm happy to say that Representative Banks uh, has been on that subcommittee with me, uh, as well as Representative Nicholas. Those are the legislators uh, that represent you on that committee. Um, we, uh, we have, I think, done some uh, tremendous work. Uh, we reached out to, uh, uh, to find the right kind of consultants to help us uh, finish up this effort of, of signage and, and interpretive uh, materials that we might want to incorporate into the Capitol. As it, as it has, um, I'm kind of looking to see, I, I hope that you all have the material on your, uh, Madam Chairman, we do have that on our website, I believe, um, that that was provided to the committee. I hope so, and I apologize if that didn't get to you, but um, I'll allow you to, uh, to reference that, that as we go along. But um, Madam Chairman, um, this uh, day and age, like everything else, we have discovered that everything we would like to do is going to be a little more expensive than uh, what we had uh, set aside or hoped for back in 2015. Um, the, you might remember that, um, that we had a, a capital group that helped to finish the construction and, um, and had some visions uh, back in 2015 with what we ought to to, uh, to do to finish up our capital. Um, in the meantime, 2018, we set aside some funding uh, for the wayfinding portion of, of what it will take to, uh, to put signage in the state capital. And as we took it up um, with the wayfinding committee this past interim, we realized that that really did not encompass what we felt like needed to happen for the work that we did on our state capital. Um, the idea that I tried to present to the committee as co-chairman. And by the way, we, as you all know, we lost our co-chairman of that committee. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Superintendent Balo cannot be here this morning to, to help visit a little bit about what we've been up to. Uh, she's off uh, on a new chapter of her life, but um, we're really gonna miss her. 
Uh, her vision was important to what uh, we have been doing. Um, obviously, she represents the educational portion of, of some of our conversations. Uh, we're excited about that particular element. But back to what we have uh, uh, ended up with, um, DI, the, the consultants that we hired, um, have done a remarkable job and presented materials that I think are spot on. And I think our challenge now is whether or not we want to try to get our arms around what is being proposed by our wayfinding committee um, and uh, whether or not we want to break that up into pieces, uh, maybe not do all of what we're suggesting. The price tag, Madam Chairman, um, is around $8 million to finish up what we think we ought to try to do. The exciting thing, uh, from my standpoint at least, is that what we have talked about, um, it was important for the Wayfinding Committee, uh, in our uh, opinion, to bring you the total of what we think it would take to do this, uh, this work correctly and right. I think it would be a shame, uh, all of us have had home projects where we've, we've maybe put a new door in, in the recreation room or something, and we just never quite got around to putting the trim up around the door. Uh, I sure don't want that to be the case for our state capital. The beautiful work that we did, I think, deserves to have the frosting on the cake uh, to really finish it up. Um, what, what the proposal includes at this point that, will, uh, that has been presented to the State Building Commission and to our Appropriations Committee, it includes um, some acoustics. Uh, many of you might remember back uh, in the in the session back in March, uh, there was a lot of comments that um, that stripping some of that acoustical paneling off of the wall has affected the ability for people to hear us when we're doing our work in the Capitol. So it includes that. It also includes uh, some work that we did uh, to, to sort of vision, what can we do with those meeting rooms where our committees meet? Um, I thought we had some tremendous ideas uh, one that I kind of favor is what if each of those meeting rooms represented a part of our state, uh, both in, in, in visuals and, uh, and perhaps even naming. Um, as, as a cost-cutting measure uh, several years ago, we really didn't end up in those meeting rooms with anything behind the dais, uh, not even a state seal or the ability to put flags in there. Uh, so, so the proposal that, that's being presented and will be coming uh, through the legislature will include those sorts of things. So that's a, that's a quick 30,000 foot view, Madam Chairman. Uh, I would value any thoughts that Representative Banks might have. Uh, he sat in on every one of those meetings and was, was a great subcommittee member. So um, I'd like to stop there and, and be able to answer questions that the committee might have. Thank you, Senator Landon. I think we'll open it up for questions for the Senator. And then um, if Representative Banks wanted to add on anything after, we'd welcome his comments as well. Any questions for Senator Landon? Uh, Representative Flitner, I see your virtual hand is raised. Committee members, just a reminder, um, please raise your virtual hand if you would like to be called on or aggressively turn on your mic and put your hand up and, and let me know. I don't wanna miss you if you have questions. Uh, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, Senator Landon, thanks for the recap. I appreciate that. And is it possible for us to actually see a breakdown of what um, those expected costs might be? I'd just be curious to know how it all kind of plays out with regard to acoustics, meeting rooms, et cetera. Uh, $8 million is, is an awful lot of money. I'm just curious if there's a breakdown. Thank you. Senator Landon. Uh Madam Chairman and Madam Co-Chairman, um, absolutely. And one of the frantic things that I was trying to do today was to, was to discover whether or not um, the presentation made it into our meeting materials. I thought it was there, um, but if it is not, I apologize. And I will get busy here in a minute and try to make sure that, uh, that I get that disseminated to all of you. So, uh, Madam Co-Chairman, I apologize. That does exist. Uh, it is a, a quality presentation that I think uh, 
that I will commend to you, obviously, and, and my apologies if it's not in our meeting materials. No problem. We did get the uh, visitor services recap fiscal year 21-22, but it's just a front back page, um, and that's about it, unless I'm missing something. Madam Chairman, I will get that to you in, in a matter of moments. I think I can get that disseminated. Um, and while we do that, uh, the answer, Madam Co-Chairman, is yes. We have a, a very detailed uh, breakdown and suggestion of what, uh, what might cost what for us to finish up. Um, much of that uh, cost, of course, is in the wayfinding, and it includes the entire Capitol Square. Um, which begins at the, the corners of the outside of the property of the state capitol building, progresses on in and includes, of course, the, the Herschler building as well, and all of the connector link. Um, if you really, um, it was pretty fascinating, Madam Co-Chairman, we as a committee spent quite a bit of time touring the facility itself. In fact, in fact we spent an entire day just walking the grounds and if you, if you take an objective look the next time you come to the Capitol and pretend like you've never been there, um, it's really pretty remarkable um, how little um, ability we provide to people to get where they need to go. Um, so the wayfinding is, a, is obviously a critical portion of what, what we are suggesting that we do. And then along with that, with all of the interpretive ideas that we have, uh, that we've been presented with by our consultants, uh, we obviously became convinced that we need to tell the story of the state capitol too. When you consider that our forefathers and, and uh, you know, the, the leaders of the state, even before we became a state, decided to build that building. We had a state capitol well under construction and two years in the making by the time we were granted statehood. So there's a lot of story that goes with our state capitol. It's one of the most popular uh, places to visit um, for people who come to our state. And so uh, that's, that's why we thought it was uh, very important that we make this a little bit more robust effort and not just the wayfinding. Representative Banks, do you have anything that you might like to add to, to what I've stated this morning? Senator Landon, how about we hear a question from Representative Jennings and then we'll ask um, Representative Banks to chime in. Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Senator Landon, I was just curious and thanks for all the hard work. If you, um, did, do you have a grand total of where this brings up construction for the capital project? Senator? Madam Chairman, uh, Representative, I do not off the top of my head. Uh, I'm sorry, I was not on the uh, on the Capitol Committee that finished up construction several years ago. And um, but um, I do remember that we were hovering around the 300 million range. Um, what we are suggesting with this eight million dollar figure to finish up the work on the Capitol. Um, is rep it represents about 2.4% uh, committee members of the entire total of what we've spent on, on the state capitol, which uh, is right in line and frankly a little bit below sometimes what, uh, what buildings uh, set us, uh, you know, what you set aside in construction efforts with respect to uh, enhancements that we're talking about. So about 2.4%. Representative, uh, I'll try to get that to you as well. Okay, um, any other questions for Senator Landon? Representative Banks, or, excuse me, yes. Do you have any follow-up comments? Thank you, um, Senator. I don't know that I have any follow-up comments. It's a very extensive plan and I think it just maybe We've lost your audio. I, I can't hear you, Representative Banks. Sorry about that. No, I think the, the um, details just maybe hit your email. It's been a very interesting plan. It's in, very extensive, as uh, Senator Landon mentioned. So uh, I just appreciate the opportunity to serve on that. We'd be uh, happy to track down any answers or questions that you have as well. Okay, thank you. 
With that, we've um, got Rihanna Davidson from LSO also on the agenda to testify. She's here in person, so we'll ask her to, to provide some remarks as well. Thanks, <clears throat> Madam Chair, Madam, excuse me, Madam Chair, members of the committee, good morning. Um, Senator Landon did a nice job of providing an overview. And the only thing I provided today for you um, was a visitor services recap discussing our visitor services program. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions regarding that and or the committee um, at this time. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Davidson? Representative Flitner? Thank you, Madam Chairman. And Rihanna, thank you. I'm just curious on your volunteers. Do you ever have um, any difficulty in gathering those volunteers or do you have a list of people that are willing to do that? It's pretty phenomenal. Ms. Davidson. Madam Chair, Representative Flintner, at this time, we've been able to sustain a volunteer base um, based on word of mouth and fulfillment of the program and people being satisfied. And so at this point, um, we have not had an issue and people are eager to serve. And the way that I describe it when selling the program is that it's a professional volunteer experience and we're just lucky to have these individuals who care passionately about the building and are really great representatives of like a nonpartisan volunteer. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions for Ms. Davidson? I just echo that, um, you know, something that I'm proud of being part of the Cheyenne community is our volunteers and people stepping up to help our community. And um, just seeing that, I, I really want to thank all the volunteers who might be listening for spending their time. And um, when I come in the building, I certainly see their welcoming faces and they're always, you know, eager to be helping visitors. And it's really remarkable. So hopefully a program we can continue to sustain. Any other comments? At this time, um, public uh, comment, or excuse me, is there any public comment on wayfinding? Madam Chairman, Senator DeGru and Representative Sweeney both have their hands up. Perfect. Thank you so much. How about we go with Representative Sweeney and then Senator DeGru. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. So just a question to Senator Landon and Representative Banks. Um, uh, on, on when you took this to appropriations, um, did they have ideas on where we might fund this? So, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Representative uh, Sweeney, that, of course, is the $10,000 question. Um, we, uh, I do believe that uh, Representative Nicholas and Senator uh, Perkins uh, have done quite a bit of effort already on this. Um, I expect that it will come out of the Appropriations Committee in some form or fashion. Uh, where they go, where they will choose to to draw the money from, uh, whatever they suggest to the rest of the legislature, um, that's really the policy discussion that we're all going to be having as as we go forward. So I'm kind of anxious to see where they landed as well. A couple of days ago, I did visit with uh, uh, the House Chairman Nicholas, and uh, he said they are working on that um, uh, recommendation, and I expect it. Um, I expect it to come out with the budget. So Representative Sweeney, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer at this point. Senator Guru. Good morning, um, Madam Chairman, Madam Chairman, um, members of the committee. Um, I can try to shed a little light on that. I serve on the Appropriations Committee and, um, and Senator Landon is absolutely right. Um, we did discuss this at length um and just before we left which seems like yesterday but it was all the way back to friday um in cheyenne and uh one of the issues one of the one of the ideas that came up was to uh um loop in um the department of tourism and uh, diane chober to uh to maybe give a hand with this as you as you all know um with the uh um, with some legislative changes that we made a couple uh, last year, um, the Department of Tourism now has has a revenue stream um, that they collect from uh, lodging from our folks with our lodging tax, and um, so it was discussed at the at uh, appropriations that maybe 
<clears throat> presenting the plan that the committee's come up with to uh, the Department of Tourism and seeing seeing what their appetite would be um, to, to help maybe take some of that out of their reserve uh, budget that they have uh, accumulated over the last couple of years. Um, and you're going to hear from Diana in just a little bit about some of the exciting things that they've come up with. But that was one thought that we had come up with as far as a possible way of funding this. And so I think that the chairs are going to get get a hold of uh, sit down with uh, sit down with Diane and the tourism board and come up with a plan uh, that could possibly do that. We also looked at at other funding mechanisms, but the 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 bottom line is I think the appropriations committee is fully on board and wants to fund this and wants to fund this good work. And I know. Um, Ms. Davidson and um, and all the team at the Capitol as, as one who spends a lot of time there over the last couple of months working on the budget. Um, no, uh, just a steady stream of visitors always coming through. Um, and it's very exciting. And 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 Senator Landon's absolutely right. Um, with a little bit of <clears throat> with a little bit of help, I think that <clears throat> we'd find that we could increase our visit our visitation, that building. Um, tenfold just when people find out where to go and what to do it's it, you know, right now it's kind of a mystery as you stand in front of that building but once you walk inside people get really excited so um, it is being worked on and the appropriations committee is working on it so uh, representative Sweeney that's the best I can give you right now thank you Senator Grew did you have any questions no perfect thank you for that additional information um, with that, we will close um, discussion on the visitation of the Wyoming Capitol. The next item on our agenda well, is Madam Chair, Chrissy Han, Senator Landon. Uh, Madam Chairman, my apologies, but thank you. I just had a couple of just final comments. Um, in your inbox this morning, you will see that report coming. And um, my apologies. I really thought that it was there in our meeting materials, but it will be there shortly to all of you. And I commend that report to you. Um, and, and I just uh, want to say how much I appreciated uh, representing uh, the legislative branch on that committee. Uh, I'll be glad to work with each one of you as we go forward and, and try to chase down any questions you might have or um, add to what, what uh, conversation we've had this morning. So uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Landon. With that, um, we'll close discussion on the visitation of the Wyoming Capitol. I would just ask at some point, uh, maybe we can get an answer to Representative Jennings' question about total amount that's been spended on the Capitol complex project. And then um, that report that we just received in our inboxes, having that part of the meeting materials for today so that people can look at it and reference it. Uh, with that, let's move on to our discussion of the Wyoming Film Production and Incentive Program. Um, we'll have LSO maybe walk us through that draft bill. Thank you, Ms. Davidson. And good morning, Mr. Brody. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairman. Um, John Brody, Legislative Service Office. Um, as the committee will recall, um, at the meeting in Dubois, a uh, motion was made and um, approved by the committee to draft a film incentives bill um, kind of modeled after the handout that was provided by the um, Board of Tourism and the working group related to this issue. Um, so basically that handout formed the substance of the bill and the direction of the bill. Um, and Madam Chairman, I'll try to be brief, but it is a fairly lengthy bill. So um, if certainly if there's questions, I can slow down and get more detailed, but. Please proceed. Uh, so if um, this is version five of the bill, which is 22 LSO 80, if you move to page two, here's where um, we set up the film incentive account where the funds um, to provide the monetary rebates, um, where those funds will come from. Uh, starting on line 10 through 15, that is going to be the um, essentially the policy statement of why the account is being set up, why the program um, is being set up in statute. 
um, to encourage the use of the state as a site for film and digital entertainment and to bolster the visitor economy by promoting the state as a tourist destination. Uh, moving to line 17, that um, basically provides the Board of Tourism with the contracting authority to enter into the rebate um, agreements with an entity that would uh, have a qualified production under the uh, film incentives program. Uh, moving on to page three, this is where we just get to the definitions of um, all the terms that are that are used in the program. Um, below the line, this is uh, Carla with LSO during um, the discussion in Dubois um, spoke to this briefly, but below the line is, is basically gonna mean um, all the expenses incurred by a production that, that wouldn't be the, you know, the top billing talent, um, you know, those, those large expenditures that are, that are part of a film production, you know, um, hiring Tom Cruise, for example. So we just provide that definition, uh, definition of board, definition of entity. Um, that's just a general term we're gonna use in the bill to define really any company that would be submitted um, or submitting an application um, for their qualified production and for a rebate. Uh, program, again, this is just the film incentives program that's being created under the bill. Uh, qualified expenditures, that's a pretty important term. Um, those, the items that are listed in this definition are the only types of expenditures that are gonna qualify for rebates under the program. So um, it's gonna be rents, for real and personal property, uh, costs for food and beverage, costs um, set of construction uh, located in the state of Wyoming, costs of supplies and materials, um, below the line salaries and employment benefits uh, rendered by Wyoming residents as part of a qualified production. Um, and then a uh, also important term used in the bill is what is a qualified production. So that's just gonna be filmed in digital entertainment partially or uh, totally produced in the state. And as uh, maybe the committee will, will recall, the program that was set up is gonna have two different rebate tiers. And I'll get into that here in just a moment, but um, that's just kind of the language to make that clear what that's uh, in reference to. And then the, the bill also uh, provides some emphasis to hire Wyoming residents. So we just made clear uh, what a Wyoming resident is in the context of this legislation. Um, moving on to page six. Um, subsection A basically just sets out um, the fact that this program exists and that it's being structured into two tier rebates. Maybe important to note that on line 13, um, the subsection makes clear that a qualified production is only gonna qualify for one rebate tier. Um, so there's no double dipping. Um, and then there are some basic requirements regardless of the tier um, for which your qualified production may be um, trying to get rebates. And beginning on line 18, that's when it starts to uh, outline what those base requirements are uh, regardless of the tier. So um, you have to provide the board with a completed application, which includes information listed in 912.413a. That's a the next statute here in the bill. Um, and basically that just lines out a number of application requirements um, that the entity will have to provide certain information to the board. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that as we get to it. But, and then it, um, that information has to be provided by somebody um, that is part of the entity that has the authority to bind the qualified production or bind the entity. Um, to the obligations that would be required uh, as part of this rebate program. Uh, moving to page seven, uh, paragraph two, that's just um, basically the entity has to have um, keep, has a, it's a record keeping requirement. So um, they have to keep accurate records, receipts of qualified expenditures, um, number of residents and why students hired, um, et cetera. Uh, moving to line eight, uh, this is a, I think, pretty standard when it comes to uh, film production, but essentially um, they have to provide the distribution plan that they have for the qualified production and provide that to the board. The idea being that um, the, at, the, at the outset, the board can get an understanding of what the scope of the project is and understand that it is actually something um, that is going to move forward. Uh, paragraph, excuse me, paragraph four, that's uh, just information provided to show that the, the entity 
is in good standing with our Department of Workforce Services in the context of workers' compensation and unemployment insurance. Um, and then paragraph five there on line 19 is just a requirement that the production um, in some manner as agreed to by the board and the entity has some Wyoming branding included. Uh, in speaking with the Board of Tourism, uh, the, the idea was that this provision gave the board a little bit more flexibility when it came to how that branding was going to be achieved. The idea being that some of these productions aren't going to be your, your sort of boilerplate uh, movie production, uh, for example. So it's not necessarily going to run credits where you would just see Made in Wyoming, perhaps. Uh, so this provides flexibility to allow for the branding to occur, but in a way that's more focused and tailored uh, to the type of production. Uh, moving on to page eight, subsection B, this is where uh, the bill is gonna set up the individual tiers, tier one and tier two. Uh, line six sets up tier one. This is gonna be your, your larger productions. This is gonna um, provide the, the bigger uh, monetary rebates. So tier one pr will provide a monetary rebate of not more than 30%. Uh, they're on line nine through 14. Those are the types of productions that will qualify under tier one. Um, and then uh, going down to uh, line 16, there's a base rebate. So you have 30 total and the, your base rebate is gonna be 15%. So to get the 15%, you have to have a 200K spend for the production on qualified expenditures. And you have to be able to substantiate to the board uh, through your um, distribution plan that your production is gonna have um, not less than a million views or exposures. Uh, moving on to line eight, this is uh, additional um, rebates that can be provided. So there's gonna be an additional 15% that the qualified production could obtain. 5% of that 15% if you um, are able to hire at least 60% Wyoming residents, you're gonna get another 5% rebate if you can demonstrate that um, post-production work was primar primarily physically completed in the state of Wyoming. Moving on to page 10, uh, you'll get an additional 2.5% if not only that, that million exposure, but if you can exceed that and demonstrate that it'll be a 7.5 million uh, viewers exposure, um, then there's another 2.5 there. And then lastly, there's an additional 2.5%. Uh, if you can demonstrate that 10% of your crew is going to be Wyoming veterans or Wyoming students. Uh, the inclusion of Wyoming residents, as the committee will recall, was a result of a, an, a part of the motion or amendment that, that generated this bill. Um, so that was included by the committee itself. Um, page 10, beginning on line 16, here's where we go into tier two. So this is... Um, aimed at your, your smaller productions that aren't gonna have as, um, you know, as, as big of a budget, perhaps just smaller productions. Um, you're gonna have a total re rebate of, of 15%. And again, similar to tier one, beginning on line 19, this is gonna um, list out the types of productions that are gonna qualify for the rebates under tier two. Um, so moving to page 11, uh, subsection, or excuse me, paragraph A. Um, you're going to have a 10% base rebate. And in order to qualify for that 10% base rebate, you're going to have to have a 50K spend, $50,000 spend on qualified expenditures. And you're going to have to be able to demonstrate that 60% of your crew uh, were Wyoming residents. Uh, in addition to that base rebate of 10%, um, you can get an additional uh, 5% um, if you're able to demonstrate that the production um, that is going to qualify under this is a, has a Wyoming theme. So, um, you know, that, that would be within, uh, you know, rules perhaps set by the board. But um, if you can show that, you know, the, the production has a Wyoming storyline or, or something to that effect. Um, you could probably qualify for that, or you could qualify for that additional rebate. All right, um, moving on to page 12. Page 12, uh, I kind of alluded to this at the outset, but um, this is the 
more detailed application requirements that are part of the rebate um, program. So in order to qualify for a tier one or tier two rebate, um, as part of the application process, you have to provide a number of pieces of information uh, to the board. One being a synopsis of the production that you're gonna be submitting. Um, you're gonna have to provide a list of all the intended qualified expenditures uh, that you're gonna try to you'll seek rebates for, that the company will seek rebates for. Um, you're going to have to detail the total dollar amount to be spent in Wyoming, including all expenditures on labor. Um, you'll have to provide information on all the below the line payroll for in-state and out-of-state um, individuals that are hired. Um, you're going to have to identify the total number of crew members beginning on page 13. Um, and that's going to include veterans, um, not only Wyoming residents, but Wyoming resident veterans, and then uh, students who are 16 years of age or older. Uh, you're gonna have to show your average crew size per day. You're gonna have to demonstrate your dates of production, whether that's prep um, or actual shooting. You're gonna have to provide information to the board in regard to your filming locations in the state. And then um, again, this is maybe belt and, belt and suspenders, but you're gonna have to provide proof uh, that you're in good standing with the workers uh, when it comes to workers' comp and unemployment insurance. Um, moving on to page 14, um, you have to provide, they'll have to provide their I-9, and then uh, there's some flexibility provided to the board that is, uh, you know, the program evolves. Perhaps there's additional information that the board feels is appropriate um, and necessary for the program, so they're provided the flexibility to uh, issue rules and, and specify what that additional information may be. Uh, beginning on line 10, this is basically just sort of a, a protection um, that prohibits any money being provided under the programs until um, one, the board has approved the application, as I've uh, kind of detailed with all that information. And then um, the qualified production has to be complete and you know all the contractual uh, commitments made to the board have been, have been fulfilled. Um, and as part of that, you know, uh, there has to be a reasonable schedule uh, for this entire, for the entirety of the qualified production. And, you know, if it falls outside of that, then the, the board has the authority to terminate the contract. And then uh, as requested by the committee, there's also a specific language being on line 15, um, requiring that there's an audit to make sure all the numbers line up and the math checks out. Um, beginning on line five on page 15, this is um, basically reporting requirements and um, some enforcement provisions when it comes to perhaps fraudulent claims. So it, it um, first in subsection A, it requires that the um, board is gonna include a report of expenditures under the act um, and um, report that to the legislature as part of its budget request. Um, subsection B is gonna require entities, um, if they're gonna obtain payment um, you know, under fraudulent means, and it makes them liable for reimbursement of any of the money that was provided under the act or under the program, excuse me. Uh, moving on to page 16. Uh, these are more conforming amendments, but uh, we went into 912-1002 and uh, just updated the language to um, uh, reflect the kind of revamped program and the new name for the program. And then moving into section three, this is the appropriation for the uh, program for the next biennium of $3 million. So um, Madam Chairman, that's basically it. Uh, we do give authority to the board to promulgate rules right away. And then the bill itself would become effective July 1 of 2022. Thank you, John. Um, questions from the committee. And I'm just going to remind us it is 913. Technically, we're taking a break at 945. I know we're going to push up against that. Um, so we have a number of people that um, have signed up online in advance. I'll go through that list. But committee members, um, just at, questions are on the bill draft. Let's avoid the policy discussion. That's not Mr. Brody's role um, to defend or not defend aspects of this bill. It's to answer any clarifying questions about the bill draft. We can talk about the substance later on. Questions for uh, Mr. Brody, I see uh, Representative Jennings and then Senator Guru. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So my question is, uh, first one is on page seven. How do we track other, you know, say a company comes to Wyoming um, and and they, maybe they're first time into Wyoming, how do we track or know that they're 
past experiences, say, in other states would not violate, say, Wyoming Workforce Services, um, maybe they're a bad actor in another state. Is there any parameters there that they cross-reference to check with Workforce Services? And then um, I think that's my, that's my main question. Mr. Brody. Uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Jennings, uh, valid question. I, I just, I don't know about that. Um, perhaps the Department of Workforce Services, um, you know, when, when these sorts of background checks are, are investigated, um, perhaps the system involves looking at other states and seeing if they're, um, you know, they have a good record, but I, I just don't have the expertise to know that. Additional questions for Mr. Brody, Senator Grew. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Brody. Um, page 16, um, line 23 is, is where I want to just, um, when it talks about the, uh, back on 22, it says the appropriation will be transferred and expended for any other purpose. And then, and any unexpended unobligated remaining funds will be um, reverted. Um, it was that from, is that from the previous, previous bill or um, one of the things I kind of wonder is, you know, why we wouldn't want to just try to build this fund back by um, having those funds revert. And if you could just help me a little bit out with that, with where that came from. Mr. Brody. Uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Guru, um, you know, this is more uh, sort of a boilerplate approach, I would say, to, to how LSO approaches appropriations oftentimes. Um, it's certainly a policy decision for the committee on whether or not the funds um, that aren't obligated or expended during that biennium, um, biennium are, you know, put back into the tourism reserve account. Um, certainly, uh, again, it, it could be either way, depending on how the committee feels is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Additional questions for Mr. Brody? I see Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Page three, and uh, I think it's also on four or five, about the below the line. I noticed that we're, we're budgeting that, that are only technical in nature. Who makes that determination if something is technical or creative? Mr. Brody. Uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Jennings, I, I would say ultimately it's the board. It's the board that's gonna be engaging um, the entities and qualified productions. It's the board that's gonna be obligating the program under the uh, contractual agreements that are formed. Um, so I, I believe it would be the board. Okay, additional questions? Seeing none, thank you. Alrighty, on the list of people that have signed up to testify online, I don't see anyone in this room, but I have the following individuals who I believe want to um, be part of this discussion. I have Britt Penrod, Kelly Estes, um, sorry, Lane, Lana, Percival, Sean Patrick Higgins, and Rudy Womack. Um, just want to do a roll call to see. And I also see Chris Brown would also like to testify. Is there anyone else that's in the virtual um, waiting room that would like to join? Okay, with that, I see Mr. Womack. Um, we'll go through that list. And then just a reminder to our panelists, um, we're scheduled to uh, take a break at 945. You know, certainly our agendas get off kilter a little bit from time to time, but let's just be mindful of our time and try and be efficient with our work. Um, so with that, Mr. Womack, uh, please proceed. Thank you very much. And I just wanna to say to the entire committee and the entire state government of Wyoming, it's very exciting to see a tax incentive for film. Uh, I myself am a filmmaker and just this year, I've assumed the role of executive director of the Wyoming International Film Festival. Um, there's a couple of things in this draft uh, that we would like to see change. I, I think some of the other people who are going to speak will speak to some of that, but I want to draw everyone's attention to page nine, lines two through six, the distribution requirement. Um, 
when we are going through this draft, it it appears that we're thinking only about studio pictures, you know, Warner Brothers or Universal. Uh, ind independent film production actually is about 90% of film production in the United States. And unfortunately, independent film production genuine, generally does not have uh, any kind of distribution deal in place, let alone a distribution deal that requires 1 million viewers. In fact, these distribution deals simply do not exist for independent film. So this line sets a benchmark that is impossible for most independent feature films to achieve. And unfortunately, since independent feature films are not covered in tier two, we are holding independent feature films to the same standard as a studio film. Um, to give a comparative kind of thing, it, it would be like telling a uh, local coffee shop that they have to achieve the same sales as Starbucks. It's physically impossible. It cannot be done. And my concern is that by having this barrier to entry for independent productions, they will not be able to benefit from the tax incentive. And ironically, most of the films that come out of Wyoming, most homegrown productions, would fall in the category of an independent feature film. So Wyoming taxpayers themselves, while they have to foot the bill for a incentive, they themselves would not be able to benefit from it if they wanted to produce their own project in the state. Questions for Mr. Womack? Uh, Mr. Womack, I, I have one. I'm, I appreciate the analogy about coffee shops, and I think it would be more apt if we said, you know, we're going to provide an incentive to co large coffee, national chain coffee shops versus non. I mean, that's where we're, we're drawing a line is trying to market Wyoming. And so I think that's kind of the thinking behind having the, the distribution requirement. Um, aside from removing this distribution requirement, have you given any thought to creating maybe a separate tier? Would that be a suggestion you'd be interested in pursuing? If, if independent feature films uh, were to move down to tier two, that would work just as well because tier two does not have a distribution requirement. And since tier two caps out at 15%, um, it, it would kind of be a give and a take for both independent films and for the state. The state could still support larger productions from studio films in the tier one and in the tier two, they could still support independent feature films. Uh, right now, the, the verbiage in tier two specifies you know, short films, music videos, so on and so forth. But tier one specifically says feature films, which is kind of an umbrella for both studio projects and for independent films. Okay. Um, I think I saw Representative Newsom had her hand up, but it looks like it's down. And then I see Representative Banks has his hand up. Let's go with Representative Banks. And if Representative Newsom wants to ask a question, she can raise her virtual hand again. Madam Chairman, thank you. Um, and you sort of addressed this on how we could edit or uh, amend the tier two. If we were looking to amend that 1 million viewers though in tier one, is there a number that would be sort of reasonable for independent films, what that reach might be or what your recommendation would be on something along that line? Unfortunately, it's Mr. almost- Womack? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, unfortunately, it's almost impossible to say because no two distribution deals for an independent film look the same. And moreover, with larger problems in the industry, such as piracy, uh, independent films really don't thrive from people actually buying it. People want to see independent films for free. Um, for instance, the, the last film that I distributed, we had 70,000 sales and we had two and a half million illegal downloads. So... It's, it's kind of difficult to say because those two and a half million certainly would not be covered in a actual distribution plan. We don't get paid for that kind of stuff. Um, so 
I, I would not want to put any kind of qualifying number on an independent production, especially since distribution has been consolidated by the studios. Um, 10 years ago, you could sell an independent film to Netflix that no longer exists. Netflix produces their own content. Um, 10 years ago, you could have gotten a Blockbuster deal. Blockbuster doesn't exist anymore. Um, studios themselves are seeing problems with distribution and they are consolidating their distribution models into streaming. That's why HBO now offers day and date release, which means a film that is released in the theaters is also on HBO on the same day. Um, big studios like Disney have now made Disney Plus. Um, and, and it's kind of a reaction by the studios themselves seeing that uh, how consumers go and view film has changed. But unfortunately, it does close the door for a lot of independent projects to get distribution deals. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Womack, um, as you would see on page two, we, are, we have a two-pronged approach. So number one, we want to foster um, a film entertainment productions in Wyoming. The other piece is the um, promoting the visitor economy, producing a piece that showcases Wyoming. Um, and so as we look at how, you know, in the advertising, which, which I see this in my world as advertising, that we're purchasing a product from independent film, from filmmakers, independent or not, to showcase Wyoming. And how do we measure that return on investment for that piece of our goal, which is to um, attract visitors? Because with, with other types of advertising, whether it's magazines or billboards or um, other sorts of things, we, we can calculate a return on investment because as we place those, we know how many views we're going to have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the challenge that we're trying to reach um, with the million viewer piece of tier one. Thank you. Mr. Womack? Of course, uh, excellent question. So as, as you said, it's kind of doing two things at once. It's encouraging the use of the, uh, the state for film and it's trying to bolster it as a tourist destination. Um, it's for independent film, it's a little bit more difficult to measure that. An independent film might only be seen by a handful of people. It might be seen by millions of people and become an indie darling and blow up. Uh, it's just extremely difficult to say because it's such a wide variety of how it could come. One way that you could measure the impact is the success of a film through a film festival strategy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am now taking on a role as a film festival director but there are more than 10,000 film festivals worldwide. Uh, obviously people know the big ones like, for instance, Sundance or Tribeca or Berlin or Cannes, um, but there are many regional festivals as well. Denver, for instance, has a very nice film festival that attracts films from all over the world. You could measure the success by that. I would also say it's a quantity game. With independent film, if you have 10 films come in and shoot in the state and show off Wyoming and encourage Wyoming brands and so on and so forth, you now have 10 pieces of media that somebody might chance upon versus one piece of media if it's just a studio film. Okay, I'd like to start wrapping up um, questions for Mr. Womack, because I, I want to offer an apology. I see Mr. Lammers from the Department of Tourism on the line, and usually it's our protocol and um, courtesy to extend the ability to testify to the depart our agencies before we open it to general public comment. So um, I just see Mr. Lammers on there. I'll ask him to, to chime in next. Anybody else have any questions, though, for Mr. Womack before we move on? Seeing none, thank you. Thank but, you very um, much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for your remarks. We appreciate it. Um, Mr. Lammers, please proceed. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. I just wanted to throw in really quick because I know we're short on time. Uh, this distribution plan thing, I just wanted to remind everyone that this is a plan. We're not asking what's your deal. You know, have you gotten something signed from a studio that says they're going to put this in theaters or on streaming? This distribution plan thing has to work for all these productions. We're talking film, we're talking TV, we're even talking car commercials. You know, what are we what are we looking at here in return on this? So for moving forward into the future, we're not just looking at theatrical spend. We're looking at, you know, how many people are going to see this. Because if we're looking at streaming, we've got things like the, the Netflix movie El Camino, which part of it was shot in Wyoming, if you don't know that. Um, you know, we've got something like that that's going to have like 6.8 million views right out of the gate. And we have that information. So it's easy to um, kind of plan where that's going to go. So we're not asking for productions to tell us what is your deal, where is this going? We just want an idea of where do you plan to show this? Where will we end up seeing it? That's pretty much it. Okay, additional questions for Mr. Lammers? Seeing none from committee members, we'll move on. Do we have Britt Penrod in the waiting room? Madam Chairman, I'm here. Good morning. Please identify yourself and uh, feel free to offer some remarks on the legislation. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Britt Penrod. I have a company called Giant Entertainment Management. It's a small uh, boutique company that I started about nine years ago. Uh, the field is uh, film and television studio development. Uh, my career is probably some 20 years uh, in that field for independent studio, uh, Raleigh Studios in Hollywood uh, prior to this. Uh, the experience spans um, probably 20, 30 years in the studio industry. Um, I've been the lead in developing maybe some odd uh, 60, 70 sound stages, a few million square feet of production support space, um, and ground up studio development projects in about 12 countries. I think there's uh, maybe close to as many studios come up out of the ground that I've been a part of or led the, um, in the development of. <clears throat> Contracts are with uh, major studios um, as well as streaming and those continue today. Currently working on about uh, four ground up studio projects in uh, two countries. Uh, through um, contacts was approached by uh, Mr. Sean Higgins to help in his effort uh, in developing uh, physical presence in order to accommodate production. And I'm happy to do so. And he asked that I participate and convey briefly and at very high level kind of the impacts of these programs on the studio environment. Um, I've done numerous studies and analysis uh, over the years, and they all conclude the same thing, that um, <clears throat> some 90% or more of the production uh, spend, the below the line spend that you were speaking of earlier, um, is actually in the community. The studio is lucky to get about 10% of that. Uh, and most of the expenditures that take place um, from that production in the community are kind of boot and blue jean type things, uh, lumber, materials, uh, transportation, uh, hotel rooms or accommodations, uh, everything from fabric and clothing, um, property, furniture, fixtures, everything that it takes to put into a set or to film it. Um, most of that uh, is what the below the line expenditure accommodates. The studio actually just gets the rental on the space uh, where they do the work. Um, I've laid uh, some studies that I've done previously to Mr. Higgins and uh, happy to share that or have him share that. Uh, just ask that that be confidential uh, amongst the members here and not for public distribution. And one of the things included in that, by the way, uh, had to do with uh, visitorship. Um, there was numerous studies done. I'm not the source of those studies, but those sources are listed that describe um, the number of visitors or the visitorship increase uh, as a result of the production industry in any particular location um, that was tracked through the Department of Tourism. And they worked with uh, local businesses in determining what was the increase in either hotel stays or trips taken. Uh, and they list specific films in the result of that visitorship uh, in that particular area. Um, I'll give you just kind of an anecdotal um, description of that, uh, Friends was a popular television show at one time and the opening credits had uh, the cast actually playing in a fountain um, uh, before. <laughs> and apparently it got to be such a popular 
location for people to go to. They started tracking how many people actually got in their car, put gas in their car, went to the fountain, jumped in the fountain, got their picture taken, stayed in a hotel and left the next day. Uh, the amount of visitorship in that particular town was uh, kind of phenomenal just as a result of an opening credit for a TV show. Uh, and there are numerous examples similar to that where Department of Tourism tracked all of that. So that's also interesting material that could be shared uh, to the members. Uh, and I'll stop there and if there are any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Penrod. Questions for our panelists? Seeing none, thank you for being part of the discussion. The next person on my list, I have Kelly Estes. Kelly on the line. Um, yes, Madam Chairman, Estes, thank you. I appreciate Good morning. the time. And Good the morning, Mr. Estes. Welcome, you please identify yourself for the record. Um, Kelly Estes, I'm in Casper, Wyoming. I've worked in and out of the film industry since 1996. Um, I worked as location liaison for Starship Troopers, which had a $4.2 million spend directly into the Casper community. We started a film office here and um, have had varying degrees of success over the years of bringing in more projects. So that's what we want to continue to do with this. Um, what I'd like to do today is just we, we restarted the film office in Casper in August of this year. Since that time, we haven't really launched it fully yet. We're launching it in April of this year. Uh, since that time, we've had a couple of scouts with the Yellowstone television series, 1883, which we lost to Montana. We think primarily due to the incentive program not being in place. Um, so I, I think that I want to really commend Diane, Charles, and all of the, this committee for their work to bring this back. It's something that our state truly needs to diversify our economy. We need to make sure that this bill is something that will work for the industry, the independent folks, as well as the others. In terms of the, the many years that I've been doing this, uh, we've worked really with a couple of large productions that were feature films. Most of them were the independents, museum documentaries, television commercials, uh, still shoots for other kinds of commercials and clothing catalogs and things of the like. What's gonna be great about this and the training programs that you guys are looking at putting in place as part of the legislation is it's gonna build that crew base for us. So these other productions, more of those other productions will be able to come here and do their productions because there's gonna be crew for them to draw from. I think Mr. Higgins is gonna he worked on a project this fall as well. He's gonna mention on his presentation, I believe that will kind of lay out the importance of having the availability of crew that's competent and trained. And I think moving in that direction is gonna be fabulous for us. I wanted to make one more point real quick. I, I looked, there was a study in New Mexico. I, I like to look at New Mexico because I think they have similar trains. They end up being Wyoming in a lot of different productions as well. New Mexico did a study this last fall and over the year 2021, they had an expenditure of 623 million from the film industry into their state, which is pretty phenomenal. They said for every dollar that they invested in their incentive program, they received $8.40 back. That's the study uh, that became part of their strategic plan as for the state of New Mexico. Um, the film industry is one of their nine target industries that they're going for in that strategic plan. And again, I just really want to make sure that um, you guys know how well this effort is appreciated and how we hope it's successful and we're looking forward to doing great things to help our state and our employees. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Estes. I see Representative Sweeney has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So, Kelly, thanks, thanks for your testimony. Do you feel with some modifications this bill would have enticed uh, 1883? Um, and because I, my limited knowledge of what they were looking for um, was basically around the state. Um, do you do you feel that this will get us on, on a path of success again. Uh, Representative Mr. Sweeney, Estes? Madam Chair, thank you for the question. Yes, I do, Mr. Sweeney. Um, 
this project, um, 1883, obviously is a television series. So if you could start to get them in place, they, they were going to bring in a crew of 200 people for the amount of time that they were going to shoot. Um, their, I don't know exactly what their shoot schedule is going to be, but the, the ability for this bill to accommodate them obviously would be easier if it existed. So once we get it in place, that'll help. The rulemaking can help make adjustments around it to make it to make it function as it is. But there are some things that have been mentioned previously and that will be mentioned in the next presentation that need to be addressed in terms of the, you know, the distribution end of things. Um, that's going to be a problem for a lot of folks. It wouldn't have been for 1883. They're one of the most popular series out there at the moment. But there's there's certain tweaks to it that I we look forward to addressing with you guys as we go forward and with LSO to make sure that we can make this something that's going to be usable for the industry. Follow-up questions? Any additional questions for Mr. Estes? Thank you for your testimony today. Um, the next person I have on my list is Lana Percival. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, welcome and please identify yourself for the record. Hi, uh, my name is Lana Percival and I'm a Wyoming native. So I'm actually here mostly as, a, as an independent citizen voicing support for this bill. So I was born and raised in Wyoming and I've been invested in working in the film industry since I was a kid. Um, I started volunteering at the local public access station when I was 15. So I spent most of my time in high school on the weekends and in the evenings filming football games and city council meetings to gain experience because that's all I had. Um, I graduated from the University of Wyoming with a degree in theater because there was no film program. And after I graduated, I had to leave the state because there was no opportunity really for me to have any kind of work in the film industry here. So I think this bill is uh, a really important step in the right direction towards creating jobs for people like me for millennials who would really like to stay in the state um, and, and work in the industry that we are interested in. So just as an example for one specific show that has a huge Wyoming storyline, um, there's a show that's called The Last of Us being filmed in Calgary right now. And it's an HBO program with a reported budget of over $10 million per episode, totaling over $100 million for the entire season. And a significant portion of that story takes place in Wyoming. It's being filmed in Calgary. And so we're losing all of those jobs uh, to an area that has a film incentive program. Um, in the last few years, just a selected list of some of the shows that we could have potentially had and lost out on are 1883, the Joe Pickett series, Longmire, potentially Yellowstone, Big Sky, Wind River, and Billy the Kid. Those, the total cast for those is over, is around 1500 people. The total crew for that is 2,732 reported. Uh, the Last of Us is still being updated. There could be more crew positions for that later on down the line. And if just the crew for those people were paid the median salary in Wyoming, that's over $155 million in wages that we could have potentially had paid out here. Um, so that's really all I have to say. It's uh, just as an independent Wyoming resident who is really invested in having some kind of incentive um, I think it's, I think this is a good bill overall, uh, and I, I really hope that you pass it. So. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Percival? Senator Landon? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Lana, thank you that, uh, for being here this morning. Really appreciate your comments. And uh, my question is related to arbitrary numbers uh, mm -hmm. versus the ability of um, perhaps a board to determine uh, what they feel like the impact of a particular production might be. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on whether or not we should stick with a hard line one million, do, 1 million viewers versus the ability of a board to, to make those determinations on a case-by-case -case basis. What are your thoughts about that? Ms. Percival? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with regard to the views, I understand um, that having people view something and seeing Wyoming in a positive light is a, is a benefit, but I think what's more important here is the potential for job creation, and that's primarily where, where my interest lies. Um, having film crew jobs in Wyoming pay out 
uh, salaries that could end up being around 70 or $80,000 a year, I think is a much uh, more important benefit than the view count, to be honest with you. Um, the other thing with the views is that it's an incredibly inconsistent metric based on my understanding. So streaming services all have a totally different definition of what counts as a view. Netflix for a long time said that if you watch something for two minutes, that counts as a view. So if there's only a portion of a movie that they watch on Netflix that takes place in Wyoming and it's 30 minutes into it, Netflix could count that as a view and they never see Wyoming. So to be honest with you, I, I don't see a lot of value in the view count. I see a lot more value in the job creation potential. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Further questions for Ms. Percival? Seeing none, thank you for signing up and for your testimony today. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next person I have on my list is Sean Patrick Higgins. Sean, are you still on there? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> yes, I am. Welcome, um, and please identify yourself for the record. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Sean Patrick Higgins. I'm the founder of Storyhouse Pictures, which is a Wyoming-based film company. I'm also the co-founder of Veteran Village, I live in Sheridan, Wyoming, um, been in this industry since 2004 in a professional capacity. And I'd like to share just briefly um, some studies that track incentives. Uh, with the permission of the chair and the committee, I'd like to pull up that study and screen share. That's fine, Mr. Higgins, but briefly, um, you know, it's 945. I know we're gonna run a little off kilter with our schedule. Yes. And I wanna make sure we have time to work this bill. So. Um, of course. Just be Thank mindful you. of our time, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. These numbers are Bureau of Labor Services numbers, the NAICS and Motion Pictures Association numbers. Um, briefly, we're just going to look at wages into the state for proxy to um, mark total business captured in the state. We're looking at study two, which removes the five top performers. And we see that the average total wage into the state is $846 million per year. Um, the opportunity here for Wyoming would to increase to become just an average player, which would be about a 28x in its growth potential into this industry. Um, we've seen versions of this in an earlier presentation, so I won't labor it, but to Lana Percival's point, this is a competitive analysis in a peer group that includes Nevada, Idaho, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska, our peer group of the Rocky Mountain West uh, and the Western United States we've seen that we've lost more than 23,000 jobs in the last decade. Um, to Lana's point, that's roughly uh, 2,100 jobs per year that we're missing in this industry. And if we look at what those total wages into the state could have been, uh, this is a list of average salaries for a $10 million budget um, for a 45 to 60 day shoot. And we could see that in this industry, 180 workdays averages about 77,000 per year in a uh, full-time equivalency salary. So these are just quick points that I'd like to point to as we discuss this bill and what it would mean. Um, one of our main needs is to drive vocational training and education in this industry so that we capture these jobs for Wyoming uh, and by Wyoming residents specifically. I'd be happy to share these in more detail and everyone has this study um, with the supporting materials in their emails. With that, I'd like to yield the remainder of any time back to Madam Chairman. And if it be your pleasure, I'd like to participate in the working of the bill. I do have some amendments, um, as Mr. Estes and others had mentioned, that I'd like to see reflected in the statutory language of the bill. Uh, thank you. Let's do questions. And then Mr. Higgins, as it, it's appropriate in our custom it, that legislators work bills. So um, to the extent that you want to offer some amendments, we would take that right now. Um, but let's see if we've got any questions from committee members. Seeing no questions, Mr. Higgins, how about you walk us through the bill? And if you have any suggestions, we'll take good notes. Um, you're free to hang out in the, the Zoom waiting room and we can call on you when we're working the bill, but it is a, our practice that just legislators be working bills. So walk us through some suggested amendments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I deeply appreciate that. Um, on page five of the bill, subsection E, line five, I would like to include above the line and per diems in qualified expenditures definition. Um, right now, the way the bill is written is we give no opportunity for Wyoming residents who happen to be directors, producers, writers, or actors themselves to be addressed or captured within the bill. I understand that we don't wanna pay incentive monies out to big uh, salaries like Harrison Ford 
who happens to be a Wyoming resident, but I would include above the line and per diems in that definition. Uh, moving down on page five, lines 13 through 16, I would suggest to strike these lines in entirety. Um, the public benefit is what I think we should focus all this language of the bill on. Public benefit measurable by full-time equivalent jobs uh, and direct spend into the state rather than a subjective or spongy uh, statutory language that discusses widespread appeal or encourages people to visit the state of Wyoming. Um, there's a natural correlation between tourism and film. And I think that there are studies that show that. And again, we should tie everything back to hard metrics rather than. Madam, uh, Madam, Madam Chairman, Pat, Pat Sweeney. Madam Chairman. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, could we go back up to above the line? Is there a way, Sean, in your opinion, that we could modify that to uh, do something on, if we, if we open it up broadly uh, to above the line, um, is there a different way to define that? Um, because I, I hadn't thought about it in the way in which you spoke on directors and actors uh, that were leaving them out and we shouldn't do that. Along those lines, Mr. Higgins, um, you know, we have a definition on page three of what below the line is, but we don't have a correlation definition of what above the line is. So that's something that would need to be hashed out if we proceed with this amendment. And then maybe some discussion of why per diem. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Sweeney. Yes, I do believe that we should include uh, an amendment that defines above the line. And I would go so far as to take Representative Sweeney's suggestion of tying that to above the line spends in relation to Wyoming resident salaries um, to not broaden it to anyone, but to really focus it on job creation for your creatives and your artists within the state. Um, that to me is the ability to not let Wyoming's youth be their number one export is to sort of attract our creative minds and the people who are filmmakers back to the state. Um, as far as the definition of per diems, I do believe that per diems are an important part of the below the line spend and should be called out from salaries uh, and employment benefits. Per diems drive a lot of the local spend and impact that Mr. Penrod was discussing in his studies. Um, those go directly to restaurants, directly to um, local establishments and the crew of 200 who's gaining a per diem per day could be tracked and then figured out how we calculate that into the qualified expenditures. It will be a huge impact number into the location. Okay, please proceed. And, you know, committee, we'll go through this. It's a, it's a big bill to begin with. And I just want to exercise a little caution. You know, we did have a work group that put this together. So, you know, maybe Mr. Higgins, if you could explain whether or not some of these ideas are, have you been vetted through that work group or if these are your own or maybe a small group of your, you and your colleagues recommending them. But I, I would just want to be respectful and understand where these um, amendments came from and who, who's been involved in drafting them. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I myself was on the Wyoming Task Force Work Group through Tourism. Um, the reason for many of these amendments are at no fault to any particular individual, but between August and December, it was my understanding that the proposed language in August was to give the Wyoming Office of Tourism Board a lot of um, a path forward in drafting how those rules and regulations would be outside of statutory language. I think that there's some um, thinking that needs to mature around the film industry from that task force. And there was many suggestions, both written and um, outreach that I had to the leaders of that task force and, and others that were not reflected in the bill or in its drafting. So with that in mind, when the bill was revealed on January 16th to me in its entirety, I wanted to make sure that in the statutory language, we didn't tie ourselves for the next 10 years or however long this bill exists to practices that are outside the film industry and practices that um, quite frankly can't be tracked or measured. I think that we need to tie it back to total spend, full-time equivalent job creation, educational opportunities. Uh, and if we're gonna do that in statutory language rather than rules, I do believe that these 
amendments should be reflected in the statutory. Okay, Mr. Higgins, please proceed. And committee members, let's let him get through all of his amendments. Take notes on what questions you'd like to go back to. But I think to push this meeting along, we need Mr. Higgins to quickly go through his suggestions and then we can come back and discuss any of his ideas or ask, ask any questions. Please proceed, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, subsection six on page five, uh, we just went through this, the striking of the widespread public appeal through encouraging people to visit the state of Wyoming. Again, a natural correlation and redundant. I believe that that would be reflected in the actual studies and in the full-time equivalent of job creation. On line 23 of page five, I've added um, an addendum page of additional definitions. I'm jumping to that here just to discuss. Um, educational internship, I think, should replace student throughout the bill. Production, the definition that I would suggest would be production provides quantifiable industry-related workforce experience in the form of industry internships to Wyoming students or young craftsmen. Young or workforce experience will include a reporting metric to be administered by the board or local Wyoming accredited educational program, i.e. University of Wyoming, Wyoming Community Colleges, Central Wyoming College, Wyoming Indian Schools, Wyoming High Schools, et cetera. In addition to on-the-job training, production will provide a minimum of three one-hour orientation or a one three-hour industry master class during the course of production. All students participating in educational internship programs must be 18 years of age or older or have parental guardian consent. Um, the 18 years of age or older would be natural in this industry. Um, I do believe that we could adopt that language every time we define student as 16 or older. Uh, professional apprenticeship uh, that production provides quantifiable industry related workforce experience in the form of professional apprenticeships to Wyoming residents. Workforce experience will include a reporting metric to be administered by the WAP board. The remainder follows the same as the educational internship. Wyoming film entity, Wyoming based production company or film related business headquartered in Wyoming for not less than 12 months. In the event that all Wyoming film production uh, incentive program application materials are equal, Wyoming film entities shall receive preference and rebate funds as administered under the bill. This preference is de delineated to promote growth of the new industry from within the state, driven by Wyoming for Wyoming to grow a more resilient economy. Call sheet. The call sheet is a daily scheduling tool utilized by productions to record working days of each member of the production, i.e. talent, crew, et cetera. And then feature film a qualified production, not less than 60 minutes with qualified expenditure that meets the minimum requirements so outlined in this act. These were all uh, additional definitions that I would suggest. And then I would add an above the line definition to this list if that chooses to be adopted. Um, moving through page seven, line four, I would include in discussing the seeking of rebates and the accurate records, um, I would, include that line four to be expenditures on the number of Wyoming residents hired and vocational training provided through educational internships and professional apprenticeships. I would strike in line five Wyoming students hired and in line six, I would include the daily call sheets and part of the metrics that are being reviewed. Um, those capture the working days as mentioned in the definition. I would strike lines eight through 12 on the same page seven, um, the distribution plan Distribution plans do not exist to my highest knowledge in any of the other 32 states that have tax incentive programs. Um, I believe that it's a very difficult thing to track. And I also believe that distribution plans sometimes come years after the actual filming and the spend has happened in the state. Moving forward, page seven, um, subsection five, the qualified production must include the branded recognition of Wyoming in the form of state, steel, state, state seal and the board logo. I would strike the remainder of that subsection in lines 20 through 23, as again, they are spongy and to be negotiated leaves an open-ended question. I think it's a common practice that folks who utilize incentives in other states include some sort of branding or logo of the state. Moving forward um, to page nine, subsection two, the 1 million viewers, I would strike in its entirety for the same reason discussed above. Um, in no other state, to my highest knowledge, there is any sort of viewership in, tied to tax incentive programs. Um, the same page, line 15, subsection one, discussing the rebate walk-ups. Um, 
This is due to the ability for Wyoming to crew a show at 60% right now does not exist. Uh, we do not have a local workforce or a localized database to uh, be successful in this. I think it would be a shame to sort of put into statutory language a 5% walk-up that cannot be utilized. And so I would suggest in subsection one that we look at additional rebate increments of 1% totaling up to 5% for demonstrating each of the 10%, the total number of people on qualified production is compromised of Wyoming residents or comprised, pardon, of Wyoming residents. Um, the next few changes address that ripple in the increment. I would look at subsection two on page nine for post-production. Post-production is not a driver of major industry or dollars into the state. Um, again, often, completely left out of other film incentive programs. I would suggest if we're to have a post-production section in tier one, we should look at a 2% rebate upon qualifying, uh, demonstrating that qualified production, post-production work was uh, physically completed in Wyoming. I would strike 22 primarily physically completed in Wyoming. Again, a spongy, um, loose term. Uh, on the next page, page 10, subsection three, I would strike in entirety the 75 or 7.5 million viewers as a walk-up. Again, a very difficult thing to track. Um, the qualified spend and the full-time equivalent job creation into the state should be the main drivers of the bill. Those dollars are being spent. Those are the dollars looking for a rebate. Sometimes films sit on a shelf for two to four years before they are even released, especially in this COVID era. Um, productions will not come if they have to wait for the rebate until there's a qualified viewership. Uh, again, there are services that exist online where you can pay to have views of the project. It's not exactly a solid footing that we wanna put in statutory language and no other state has it in their incentive program. I would replace that with a suggested subsection uh, three on page seven of 10, a 2% rebate upon demonstrating strategic placement and screen time of Wyoming small business businesses, ranch brands, names, Wyoming clothing brands, Wyoming national parks, Wyoming museums to drive economic spend by audiences to Wyoming businesses. I think this would be something where we can champion small businesses and Wyoming ranchers. Um, people like Kate Wilshire of Turtle Ranch, I think would support in this. Um, and it's another way to guide dollars back to our local uh, Wyoming businesses. On the same page 10, um, item four, I would look at a 6% total possible rebate in increments of 2% upon demonstrating that not less than 10% of the qualified production crew were Wyoming veterans, uh, educational interns, professional apprenticeships, or Native American indigenous peoples hired to qualified production. Um, I would return for Wyoming students the 18 years of age or with written guardian consent. Um, on line 13, I would look at Wyoming educational intern shall not be required to be a Wyoming res resident under the same subdivision. I do believe that any Wyoming students or any educational interns from within the state would qualify as a Wyoming resident um, just based on how we define Wyoming resident earlier in this bill. Um, the next page, if I'm Going forward, I would look at uh, page 14, subsection C. Again, I would look at when defining the Wyoming resident veterans, I would add educational interns or professional apprentices under this uh, subsection. Continuing on, I would look at page um, 15, paragraph two under subsection B. The qualified production substantially all contractual commitments made to the board have been fulfilled in accordance with this contract. I would strike the rest of the suggestion um, from lines 19 through 22 that deal with a reasonable, uh, reasonable schedule or timeline. Again, these productions will have already spent the dollars into the state. They will have already created the jobs. Um, there's an instance of Indiana Jones 5 where Harrison Ford separated his shoulder they have been on a production hold for four months that was unplanned. If we tie our productions to some sort of timeline deliverable, um, I think that that's a very tricky um, situation. 
I could see the board amending this in rules and regulations, but again, to have it in statutory language could be uh, difficult and binding going forward. On page 16, subsection three, uh, due to the amount of work that it would be to audit these processes, I would suggest that the board or board and state approved third party audit service has been completed uh, as an audit of the entity qualified expenditures. The extension of this is that if the board in the state were to approve a third party or a short list of third party audit services who have experience in this industry vetted by the state, it would lift some of the workload from the board of tourism moving forward. Um, and then the same page and my last suggested amendment would be page 16, um, sub or line 14 under subsection A, when discussing the 2024 biennial budget request, I would extend it in line 14 to uh, include some sort of metric in which we're gonna measure this. Uh, if the total spend into the state inspired by this act is six X or greater, um, just above a 30 or 35% IRR, on appropriations set forth in this act's initial two-year period, then the board will present a plan detailing a greater appropriation and scalable Wyoming film production incentive program for consideration in the 2024 biennial budget request. This is to give us some framework and goals on what we're setting out to achieve with this initial $3 million appropriation. I do believe that we will be successful in that if we work forward uh, and create this vocational opportunity for our Wyoming residents to actualize a lot of this below the line spent. I know that was a lot. Thank you for your time and attention. And I will um, yield back to Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. I'm gonna just make a comment before we dive into some questions. I, and only speaking for myself, I think where I had comfort with the bill draft was knowing that a work group had come together to give us a proposal. And so I'm a little uneasy with some pretty substantial changes um, that haven't been vet vetted by a work group. I'm, you know, I, there's only so much time we have as legislators. And so we do rely on citizens to come together that have expertise, hash out some of these um, details. And so I, I am a little concerned about the, the scope and the breadth of the, the changes we're being asked to consider. Um, so with that, I just want to make my concerns known. Um, Happy to entertain questions from committee members. Senator Garou. Thanks, Madam Chairman. And boy, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I really do. And Sean, thank you for, thank you. I mean, obviously you spent a lot of time on this. And um, I guess one global question um, on this is, and just give me your thoughts at a high level view because of the time constraints, but all that you've talked about, all the, all the, substantive changes that you've talked about in this bill um couldn't we really work a lot of this out in rules i know you talked a couple of times there about you know want more specifics and not the squishy language and all that but one of the things I, I really am serious about this is saying you know if we could have a chance to work this out and promulgate them in rules and then come back and say if there are things that aren't working then we can change the legislation as we go but did you talk at all about that in your meetings with the work group and, and, and just kind of give me a flavor of that if you could, thanks. Mr. Higgins, and then we'll have uh, Representative Haroldson. If you have any questions, please raise your virtual hand, other committee members. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Guru. I uh, completely agree with you. I do believe much of this could be worked out in rules uh, with the board and the committee moving forward. It is not my intention to create any doubt in the um, benefit that this film production incentive bill would have for the state. It is to create the strongest bill moving forward so that you all as the committee can stand tall in it. I believe that there's a, a simple um, tie back to rules. And if we were to cut all the statutory language that has to do with the walk-up as it exists in the bill and modify that tier one walk-up to say that additional 15% would be allocated forthcoming by the rules uh, administered by the governing board, I think that would be a great solve to about 16 of these suggestions that I put forward. Um, I think that's a quick and easy way to make sure that we have uh, valued input moving forward from folks in the film industry and that we can move a uh, succinct and tight bill uh, forward through the next sessions. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Haroldson. And then committee members, it's 10.08. We are beyond um, our scheduled break time. I'd like to finish working this bill. Um, I also want to make sure um, during the Appropriations Committee meetings that were held last week, um, the Appropriations Committee um, wanted the Department of Tourism to provide us with an update on their budget request. And because we had to reschedule this meeting, we didn't have that opportunity earlier this year. And so if there's anyone from the Department of Tourism, I, I can't see the full screen. I'm guessing someone, maybe Director Schober's on there, but we've been asked to cover that as a committee. And um, I wanna make sure that we've got time to do that. So I'd like to finish this film bill and then get an update on the Department of Tourism's budget request before we take a break. With that, Representative Haroldson. Thank you. So Sean, first of all, Good job. I, I appreciate your work. Um, I do agree a little bit with my colleagues that there's just a lot. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where it's dumped on. Um, and I was looking through emails. Did this, did your edited edition get sent to us? Okay. Yes. And that was from the 19th, correct? Yes. I believe um, he, we were emailed a copy of this. Yeah. Representative Harrelton, any additional it's, questions? Yeah, okay. um, so I think that obviously um, you're clarification on minor being the 18 or 16 with parental is definitely really good. And so I, I think there's definitely some really good things here. Um, honestly, my biggest issue is uh, we're in the last hours and we don't want it to be a deal where we lose. Um, I don't know. I just, I think we need to be careful because if we do too much modification at this point, I think we're going to probably hurt ourselves more than help ourselves. So, but thank you, Sean, for that. And I will definitely pull up that 19th. And so I have a little bit better idea. Further questions from committee members? With that, thank you, Mr. Higgins, for your work in providing these thoughts and your testimony today. Madam um, Chair, if I may, um, I do believe that there are only just four suggestions or even two that we could focus on. Um, I would turn the attention towards viewership, distribution plans, and striking those as they exist in the bill. And then I would move to look at the walk-up rebates as to be determined by rules and regulations moving forward by the administering board of Wyoming Office of Tourism. And I would look at the biennial uh, request to build some sort of metric focused on spend and full-time equivalent job creation into the state. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and to all the committee. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Um, next up on my list, I have Chris Brown. And then is someone from the Department of Tourism online? I just wanna make sure we've got that teed up. Madam Chairman, it's Director Schober and I'm here. Perfect, thank you. Let's hear from Mr. Brown and then Director Schober. Chairwoman Ellis and members of the committee, good morning. Chris Brown representing the Wyoming Lodging and Restaurant Association, the Wyoming Travel Industry Coalition. I've testified all interim um, on behalf of this bill and our strong support for it. So I will not repeat uh, my testimony from the previous two meetings. I do think one point that is important to underscore I believe Senator Guru made this earlier, and that is that the Office of Tourism and the Tourism Board are now proposing a budget that is completely off of the general fund and funded entirely by the dedicated funding source, and that the fiscal note attached to this bill, should it move forward, would come from that projects and reserve account funded by the dedicated funding source and not through general funds. Madam Chairwoman, thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Brown? Seeing none. Uh, Director Schober, um, before we start working this bill, I apologize, I didn't see you in the waiting room. Would you like to offer some remarks on this bill? Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you, members of the committee. Diane Schober, Executive Director at the Wyoming Office of Tourism. And as you can see, there's been a lot of input on um, getting this ready. I just would offer up for you that uh, the working group did put together the white paper that we shared with you in August. And that does provide the framework and the guidelines uh, for the legislation that you have before you. And uh, with probably some um, modifications, uh, if you wanna take things into consideration that you've heard today, that that provides a really good guideline for us to promulgate rules. Um, I think there's some additional information that was shared with you today that would be really helpful in adding that to the rules that could make those very strong. Um, also, I just want to, um, remind all of you too that we are already required to submit reports and we uh, shared former reports with you from this legislation uh, when it was in its prior iterations. And so we just um, 
uh, we believe that the bill is in good shape with probably a few minor um, amendments here. And as far as the distribution, we've had conversations around what would be a better way to do that. And we just haven't found or had a solid uh, recommendation yet that felt like it could work. And I would refer to um, LSO and John Brody, but in order to meet that constitutional muster of a film incentive program, you have to have adequate consideration and a public purpose. And that requires this being able to have a distribution plan to be seen by others so that there is a related tourism value to it. And so just um, wanna put that out there that we've, uh, we're anxious to see where you can take this and hopefully move it out of committee today, but here to answer any questions if you have them, thank you. Director Schober, um, it looks like we've got Representative Sweeney. I, I'm gonna ask a question before I get to the good representative. I think the question I have is, or the concern is, you know, I've got kids who are making podcasts, they're making videos on their, you know, devices, and it's pretty cool. But, you know, when you look at the universe of who's watching some of these productions, you know, it's a handful of people. And so is that kind of the concern that somehow you might have a production company that invests money and, and tries to put something together, but at the end of the day, their plan to distribute it is just putting it on the internet and not having any assurance that there's viewership and then the Wyoming provides a rebate for that. I mean, I, that's the, the concern I have is that, you know, what value did we get out of that then if no one's watching that content? And it's, I agree, difficult in this day and age um, because of the variety of um, streaming services. And it's not like just opening day at the, the box office. So can you talk a little bit about how your agency and how that work group has maybe struggled to get to that 1 million viewership? Uh, Madam Chairman and members of the committee, the, uh, in the prior iteration of the bill, it was not defined in statute that there was a minimum distribution. And therein lied some problems as we promulgated rules and got ready to do evaluations. And the, the process as we moved through it was that there's an application and those are all projections. So when a, a company comes to the state of Wyoming or if they're here in Wyoming and they want to put forth a plan to apply, um, there was a, um, what we would have, what we recommended this, this committee was to include a minimum distribution plan. Um, and then that is vetted against the final report. And certainly what is uh, submitted sometimes in planning doesn't always uh, come out the way it was in the final report because you know different things can happen, timing or distribution plans. But in order to assure that there are eyeballs that see these productions, um, that's why we wanted some type of minimum distribution plan. We work with our ad agency to evaluate all kinds of online outlets uh, to look at the a number of available impressions. And I certainly know that there could be some additional information added to that uh, through this working group. Uh, some of the information that we wanted to use is, um, was recommended to us as proprietary, but I believe that there could be an alternative around this. If we could come to some minimum number uh, within the, the working group of, of film folks on here. And then how we get to that minimum number, I believe we could work that out in rules. And so hopefully that answers your question, Madam Chairman and members of the committee, is that you know we just we really believe in order to stay with this constitutional muster that we need that kind of minimum uh, distribution. But also in this, when you added tier two, it was to allow for many of these up and coming smaller types of productions. And this was modeled a lot after what is taking place in Oklahoma and New Mexico. And uh, we certainly looked at other film incentive programs to stage that and reviewed that with the working group this summer as well. Okay. Representative Sweeney. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. So Diane, in, in looking through this, because I take it, um, we're not gonna be able to ask these questions um, as we're working this, um, I have concerns um, as we're putting in statute uh, page five um, below the line in the definition section. Um, I, I tend to agree with Sean's comments and others' comments that above the line should also be included within the definitions and this per diem. Um, and then to your points on 
um, you know, qualified production in, um, uh, is there a way back on page seven um, on the distribution plan um, to keep that broad versus, I think it's uh, seven and a half million views. I mean, as we're working through this bill, um, I think there's some great recommendations and I don't wanna see us uh, not try to encourage production with some of these changes. Director Schober. Uh, Madam Chairman and Representative Sweeney, the, uh, we don't have um, a strong opinion either way about the above or below the line. Um, the prior statutory language did not include above the line and it was the preference of the, uh, that then Joint Travel, Recreation, Wildlife and Cultural Resources Committee to not include it. Um, they at that time, um, that was their decision to not include above the line. But the Office of Tourism, we don't have any um, opinion either way. And if it's the preference of the committee, that wouldn't, it wouldn't affect our work as we go through and, and um, work through this program. As for the distribution, and I would have to defer to uh, um, others, uh, probably LSO on this with you, is if there would be a possibility of putting in like a minimum distribution or a distribution plan to be defined in rules, I don't know what the what the appropriate way to address that is. Um, you know, I, I think there's, I believe that there is flexibility here to be able to address it. And I know that you all are anxious to have some kind of recommendation and we're not hard pressed on a number. We just want to find an adequate way in which we can make sure that that's covered and that it meets the muster of, of what we need to make sure that this uh, is a solid film production bill. Further questions for Director Schober? Seeing none, thank you. Um, Director Schober, if you don't mind sticking around while we work the bill, we might call on you for questions as we do that work. LSO, does anyone have, um, is anyone else in the waiting room that I haven't listed that wanted to testify on this bill that you're aware of? Nope, no one else is um, online to testify and there's no one in the room, so public comment is closed. Committee members, what's your pleasure on this bill? Sweeney moved move the bill. Sweeney's moved the bill, I see. Sorry, I just, there's a glare on the TV. Senator Landon? Second. All righty, committee members. It's been moved and seconded. Um, I think what we'll do is try and work this bill page by page so um, any suggested amendments on page one? Any suggested amendments on page two? Page three? Page four? Page five? Uh, Madam Chairman? Representative Newsom, it sounds like. I have um, amendment in the definitions to define above the line. And I, I would um, ask LSO to get with the Office of Tourism and um, members of the working committee to make to provide that definition. I would so, second that, Madam Chairman, Senator Landon. So uh, an amendment to include in the definitions that, that would be on page three if we're doing it alphabetically, which it looks like LSO has done to define above the line. Yes. Okay, and it's been moved and I think I heard a second on there by Senator Landon. Um, comments from committee members. I, I have one, or oh, was there Senator Landon? Well, uh, Madam Chairman, thank you. And I, um, I, I guess I might uh, can, um, ask that the uh, bringer of the amendment consider a, a friendly amendment along with it and just incorporate the language suggested by Sean a little bit earlier 
to not only provide for that definition, but on page five, line five, to include above the line and, and per diems in that language. Um, if we don't want to do it that way, we can come back and do a separate amendment for that. Uh, but we've got to have a definition of above the line. So thank you. Representative Newsom, is that a friendly amendment? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, committee members. Um, you know, I made note of this and it seems like a reasonable ask. I think my concern is that I don't see a definition. Um, we're asking, we're voting on it to be included in a bill draft and we're asking a working group to come up with something and then putting LSO in that position of guessing what we approve. I just think we need a language, at least a starting point beyond something that's conceptual of what above the line is. Um, so I would urge us to defeat this amendment and not to say that if this bill gets introduced um, that we look at that in whatever committee it's assigned to either on the House or Senate side. But right now I just think it's premature. I just don't know what that definition is. Further discussion? All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Okay, LSO is gonna do a count because I can't, I don't see the full screen. Heather, when you've got that count, let me know. Five, I see five hands there, raised. Five hands raised. All those opposed, opposed, please raise your hands. Seven no's. We have seven no's. So five to seven, that amendment is defeated. And again, committee members, I think, you know, worth the discussion, but probably just need to have the idea fleshed out a little bit more thoroughly. Um, further amendments on page five. Madam Chairman. Representative uh, Sweeney. Sweeney. Um, I would um, like to strike uh, lines 13 on page five, lines 13, 14, 15, and 16. Okay, is there a second? I don't see a second. If you are seconding it, I don't see the full screen. I need to hear your audio. Okay, that amendment fails due to a lack of second. Any other amendments for page five? Page six. Um, Madam Chairman, back to page five. Representative Sweeney. Um, I would like to incorporate the additional definitions that Mr. Higgins brought forward, which would appear on page five. They would be inserted on, starting on line 23. Um, uh, in, in his working draft, he had proposed, proposed a number of uh, different definitions to be added. Um, and uh, I would take that in, in its entirety um, to be added in. Okay, for clarification, it looks like the motion is, and correct me if I'm wrong, would insert several new definitions, one for educational internship, one for professional apprenticeship, one for Wyoming film entity, one for a call sheet, and one for a feature film. Is there a second to Representative Sweeney's motion? Committee members, and I can't, if you're raising your hand, I just can't see the full screen from where I'm sitting. Uh, Senator Madam Landon's Chairman, got the second. I second that just for, just for discussion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded discussion on the proposed amendment. Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I just a question back to this. So 
now we're being asked to subsidize training for this industry. If I'm understanding this amendment correctly, is that, if not, could we have a little more explanation to it? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Senator Landon. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my understanding to the representative is that we're actually requiring the film industry to uh, provide this kind of training to our um, population here in Wyoming. Uh, so that's, a, that's an added ask on the part of Wyoming to uh, require these companies to come in and, and provide these workshops. Uh, the reason I seconded Madam Chairman is um, honestly, I think there was a lot of good work done by uh, Sean and his group, wherever that is. And uh, I, I absolutely agree with you that uh, the working group has developed this bill and we should probably try to stick to that. Um, and, but I would say that we probably have quite a bit of work to do uh, to get this bill up to the, the kind of level that I think it needs to be. Uh, and we can do that during the session. Um, these definitions actually really do pertain. So thank you. Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I just am, my only concern is obviously if we add these definitions, then we're going to have to, there's a lot of amendments that would be required to make sure that we bring the bill up to speed to align with the definitions. So, I mean, I think that's something we definitely need to consider is uh, these would be changing a lot of the definitions that are already currently in the bill uh, to different nomenclature. We just need to make sure that we don't miss any and create something that's uh, incomplete or, or inaccurate. Thank you. Senator Salazar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I guess uh, I have uh, the same views that you do, Madam Chair, and uh, with regard to uh, we're running out of time and um, the other thing is that we put in veterans here in Dubois and now we're putting in educational interns and I, I have discomfort with that and um, I wanted to express that. So thank you. Madam Chairman. Uh, Other comments, Sweeney. Representative Sweeney? Uh, yes, before we vote on this amendment, my thought process committee is uh, with all due respect, is if we can have some of these baseline um, amendments in place so that taking it forward um, with our committee work, I think it'll make it a little bit easier once we get to session and work this through committee um, and have less uh, chance of failure to get it. Um, uh, better perfected. So with that, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Further comments from committee members? Just one comment I'd have, you know, I serve on the Senate Education Committee, the Joint Education Committee, and we have a lot of conversations with our community colleges about programs they offer. And, um, you know, if we were to advance this bill with the suggested changes, I can foresee questions about what our community colleges are offering. Is this something that's going to be utilized? Right now, I just, I can't answer any of those questions. I don't know. Um, so I think, you know, the objective is a good one, but, you know, now we're talking not just about a bill that provides a film incentive, but that's trying to provide, a, you know, college opportunity in film. And I think that's a worthy goal, but um, I just don't know that we've done the work to, to get there in this bill as of today. So with that, any other comments by committee members? Seeing none, LSO, um, will you keep a tally all those in favor of incorporating um, those definitions, feature film, call sheet, Wyoming film industry, professional apprenticeship, and educational internship, please raise your hand. And Heather, whenever you've got that number, let me know. Two eyes. We have two eyes. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Twelve no's. Twelve no's. The amendment has failed. Any other additions for amendments on page five? Seeing none, any amendments on page six? 
and, se and representatives and senators, um, I can't see all of you. So if you have an amendment, please unmute mute yourself and just speak up, okay? Page seven. Page madam, eight. Mad, oh. madam, madam Chairman. Representative uh, Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Page seven, line six. Um, being we didn't adopt the definitions, I would add on line six, um, it currently reads shall include payroll records. And I would like to add and daily call sheets. It's been moved. Is there a second? Please unmute yourself and let me know if you second that motion. Second. Second, and I don't didn't see who that was. Guru. Representative Sweeney, do you want to explain? Um, I just I think it adds to the bill and um, um, and uh, adds adds for a little bit more clarity um, on what we're looking at. Uh, you know, to the bill. Uh, Representative Haroldson, comments or questions? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, without definition of what a daily call sheet is, I don't know if we should be putting it in there. Further comments from committee members? Seeing none, all those in favor of Representative Sweeney's motion to add the words and daily call sheet on line six after the word payroll, please raise your hand. LSO will count. Three eyes. Three eyes. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Eleven no's. Eleven no's. The amendment has failed. Moving on, is there any? Are there any more suggested amendments or proposed amendments on page seven? Page eight. Page nine. Senator Le, Je, or Representative Jennings. Madam Chairman, I um, I don't know if I'm going to have an amendment to this, but I I missed it when we were going through it the first time, and I. Just have a question. Actually, I have two things to say. Uh, on page eight, line seven, um, do we have a definition of the traditional media and sending? You know, I think I'll let that one go, Adam. I, um, I would at the end. I would like to have a little bit of time to speak, and I'll I'll just forego this. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Any other proposed amendments? Page eight, page nine. Madam Chairman, um, Representative I think Sweeney. I know where, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I would propose striking um, lines two through six. Uh, if I get a second. Um, Is there a second? to Representative Sweeney's motion to strike lines two through six on page nine. I'll second it. Senator Schuler seconded discussion by committee members, Rep Representative Sweeney. So I think uh, to Sean's and other Rudy's point, um, we're to, to define the 1 million viewers, um, I, I I don't know. We've heard that modern day that's not really possible. Um, and if this is, I, I would love to see something in rules, but if we're putting this in the legislation, I think we're killing ourselves. Um, and that that's that's my thought there. Further comments by committee members on the proposed amendment. 
Seeing none, all those in favor of Representative Sweeney's motion, please raise your hand. One, two, and I'll let LSO count since I can't see everybody. Three ayes. Three ayes, all opposed, please raise your hand. Eleven no's. Eleven no's. The amendment has failed. Any other um, proposed amendments on page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve, page thirteen, page fourteen, page fifteen. Page 16. Madam Chair. I think that I knew you were coming, Senator Guru. Yeah, uh, you knew I was. <laughs> um, on page 16, line 23, uh, insert a period after the word purpose. Delete the um, rest of the line and lines one and two on page 17. Is there a second? I don't second. Know. I see Sweeney seconded. Discussion, Senator Guru. Just as we, as I talked about before, um, you know, and we'll t I too would like to talk a little bit about this bill. I'm for this bill. I just want to want to make sure that we build build an adequate account to do all the things that we want to do here and all the good ideas that we've heard. So I'd like to see this money just stay with the film and Senate. Further, dis further discussion on the proposed amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Seven eyes. Seven eyes. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Seven no's. Seven no's. Remind me that fails. That failed. Man, Any other proposed amendments man, on page oh, line? Man, Ms. Ma Madam Representative Chairman, Sweeney. Uh, if I could go back to page 15, I apologize. Um, line one, um, if uh, to that language, um, the board as it reads now, or uh, the board, and then add or board and state approved third party audit service. And then it completes, has completed an audit of the entity. Um, and, and if I get a second, I'll explain that. Second, Guru. Moved and seconded by Senator Guru as the second. Um, Madam, Madam Representative Chairman. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So the way it currently reads, um, it, it doesn't allow, in my opinion, doesn't really allow the board to let somebody else view this, a third party. Um, and all this is giving a little more uh, room, because if you have a major production coming in, perhaps we don't have the staff at the Division of Tourism um, to take care of this, so they could contract with a third-party audit service. That's that's all this is clarifying in my mind. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Representative Sweeney. Um, I'm going to ask LSO to weigh in um, on whether or not you think the board has the authority to hire a third party independent auditor to do this work. Uh, Madam Chairman, John Brody, LSO. Um, I guess the short answer is I don't know. Um, 
Certainly the board has a number of administrative obligations under the bill and can promulgate rules as necessary. Uh, one of those obligations is to conduct an audit. So um, I don't think it's beyond the scope of the bill to envision um, them being able to hire uh, third party assistance. Um, I guess I would just one point with regard to the amendment is it's a little unclear what state approved would mean. Does that mean the board has to get legislative approval? Does that mean the, the governor has to provide explicit authority for this? Um, just something for the committee to consider. Further discussion by the committee? You know, I would join LSO in saying, I don't know for certain, but I would guess that the board contracts all kinds of services out that maybe they're not explicitly authorized to do so. And so I do share the concern about what is state approved um, you know, certainly we don't ask the board to, the only entity I'm aware of that we ask to do audits directly is, you know, Department of Audit. Um, and when we give people authority to audit things, I think it's implied um, that they can contract those services out to professionals who do that. But, um, you know, so I'm inclined to say no, just until we get the answer. If further analysis shows that this is necessary to make it clear that they have this authority, then I'd be happy to, to run that amendment later on. But my inclination right now is to let this one go, but I don't have a strong feeling any which way. I don't know that to LSO's point that state approved is the language. Any other further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of Representative Sweeney's motion to insert the word or board and state approved third party on line one, after the word board, please raise your hand. Two eyes. Two eyes. All opposed, no. Please raise your hand. We're thorough in our work, committee members. Count those no's. 12 no's. 12 no's, the amendments failed. Um, I will make a note and ask LSO to help me make sure that we look into that a little bit more to make sure the board has the authority um, to contract out for those kind of services. Any other additional amendments proposed, committee um, member? I see, here's someone. Uh, that's Representative, Representative Newsom. Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to make, make take another swing at this reversion on um, page 16, line 23 going to page 17, um, the first two lines. And I would like to leave the any unexpended, uh, unobligated remaining funds from this approach, appropriation shall revert to the special um, project fund budget item of Wyoming Office of Tourism, however you would say that, um, and delete as provided by law on June 30th, 2024. So that just puts it back into the special um, projects budget of the Office of Tourism instead of reverting to, I don't know where, I'm assuming that reversion would be to the general fund. LSO, do you have the name of that account? The... Uh, yeah, Madam Chairman, uh, on page 16, uh, line 18, uh, it's the reference and the statutory reference to the account from which these funds are being appropriated. So we could easily... Um, revert the money clearly back to that account. Okay, so clarifying amendment maybe through LSO, referencing that statutory reference on page 16. It's been moved, is there a second? Okay. Uh, Guru seconded. Any comments from committee members? Seeing none, all those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Nine eyes. Nine eyes. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Five no's. Five no's. The amendment's passed. Any other proposed amendments on lines or pages 16 and 17? 
Seeing none, seeing none, any comments on the bill Question. before we do a roll call vote? Representative, or excuse me, Senator Landon. Thank you, Madam Chairman, not to belabor or keep us any longer, but I, I, I would say this, I think uh, I really appreciated our public comment today. I, I thought there was some very good points brought up uh, with regard to this bill. And I just have, I'm gonna support the bill uh, because I was very disappointed uh, way back when, when we eliminated this program in the first place, um, many of us predicted exactly what has happened. Um, so I support this, but, but I do think that we need to be ready uh, to go to work on this bill a little bit. Um, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, in particular, the uh, 1 million viewer uh, threshold. I, I think that's fuzzy. I, I think, you know, the distribution uh, thing, we've got to work on that a little bit. Um, but hopefully we can do that in the middle of a very busy session. And, um, and I hope that, that our, one of our chambers will at least allow this bill to to go into the process so that we can do that work. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Further comments, I see Representative Sweeney and Senator Guru, committee members, it is 1045. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I just wanna remind the committee that this is not coming out of the general fund. Uh, it's uh, not a new tax. Um, it is a way to diversify our economy. I urge you to vote for this. It has a, a ton of good met, uh, good possibilities. You've heard from industry what we've lost uh, because we had nothing uh, to provide some of these crews and productions. And I just urge uh, your support. Senator Guru. Thanks, Madam Chairman. And then, and then Representative Jennings after that. And committee members, if you'd like to speak, please uh, raise your virtual hand right now. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, on and for, um, you know, in appropriations, we just spent a lot better part of the last month talking a lot about economic development. Um, we're going to put a package together for you that you're going to see on your desk when you get there, uh, you know, over $200 million in economic development spending in the energy industry and business, um, general business, um, and all types of things. And this is another piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, as Representative Sweeney mentioned before, this is something that we've had before. It got lost during budget cuts in previous years. Uh, but if you look at the states around us, what the states are doing, um, in this field, um, they're just beating us to the punch. And we know our states a, is <laughs> frankly a better location to do their work. And also this is a good economic driver for tourism and for employment. And so I urge you, I urge you to move this bill forward and let's keep working on it. Let's come up with some rules that we can work with, but uh, let's keep it moving forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll try and be brief, but I have a couple of things I want to just point out and point to and read you two short things out of the Constitution. One is uh, Section 20, and I'll just read a sentence out of it. Um, Article 7, Section 20, and we've not even touched this aspect in going over this bill at all that I'm aware of. Uh, it shall be the duty of the legislature to protect and promote these vital interests by such measures for the encouragement of temperance and virtue and such restrictions upon vice and immorality of every sort as deemed necessary to the public welfare. And I was thinking about my arguments um, in the previous times, and, and I know that we have people um, from industry, and I'm not talking about them. I'm sure that that's, this is not an issue for them, but I don't, I don't see any in this bill, any immoral prohibition. So I think we could we could see that it, this could go anywhere. We don't have any uh, encouragement whatsoever in this bill towards temperance or virtue, things of that nature. We don't have any prohibition of uh, an anti-Wyoming sentiment. And not again, not the people who have come from industry, but this industry overall um, does not like a lot of things in a Wyoming culture, such as our extractive industries, our mineral industries. Um, and yet 
even anti-American is not touched on this. We could use, this could be conceivably used to even train people in anti-American or anti-Wyoming sentiment. And as long as they reach certain things, we would be funding them. We would be helping on that. So I, I would urge the committee to think about the constitutional aspect that we've not even touched there. We don't even, we didn't even put anything in the bill. And then I would uh, point your attention to Article 3, Section 36 of prohibited appropriations. No appropriation shall be made for charitable, industrial, which I would think this would fit there, educational, or benevolent purposes to any person, corporation, or community not under the absolute control of the state, nor to any denomination or sectarian institution or association. So when I hear the industry um, earlier on, it doesn't like putting the bill for other winners inside their industry. We're talking about the independent producers. They didn't like that, but apparently it's okay for Starbucks, which was brought up, to foot the bill for their industry, whether they be large or small. And so I have real issue with that, that we're picking winners and losers of who's going to get this money. And, and again, Article 3 makes it very clear we had an LSO note saying that, yeah, there could be some constitutional issues to this. Uh, if we pass this forward, I'd I wouldn't be at all surprised to see. I mean, my third and final statement back to that would be is how does this below the line expenditures compare to the out of state construction industry, for instance? We're not, we're not um, trying to take from one industry and pick another industry and so that we can, uh, I mean, where do we stop? We already, we've heard that there's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars in economic development, which really is government picking winners and losers. And we're prohibited by the state constitution. So I would appeal to your, um, to your conscience side that you took an oath to the constitution. And I get that this is, uh, you know, a money maker, probably a good deal. There's probably lots of good people involved in this industry besides some possible nefarious players. But we took an oath. And if we want to change the Constitution, let's go about that business. Let's, let's uh, put that before the people and let's do that. But we took an oath to say that we weren't going to take from one group of people and give to another group of people. And that we weren't going to pick winners, winners and losers in an industry. The independent industry looks at this right now. And as they come to the trough, they say, hey, look, it's not fair to us. And, the, and as I look at the bill, it's not it's not fair to the independent ones. So I, I would uh, appeal to your conscience that uh, we took a, an oath to the uh, Constitution. And again, I would urge a no vote. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Representative Jennings. Any other comments on this bill before we take it to a roll call vote? Seeing none, LSO, will you please do a roll call vote? We are voting on working draft. LSO 22 LSO 0080 working draft number five. Senator Carew. Aye. Senator Landon. Aye. Senator Salazar. Aye. Senator Schuler. Aye. <clears throat> Representative Banks. Aye. Representative Haroldson. Aye. Representative Jennings? No. Representative Knapp? No. Representative Newsom? Aye. Representative Sweeney? Aye. Representative Williams? Aye. Representative Winter? No. Co-Chairman Flitner? Aye. Chairman Ellis? Aye. Committee members, with your permission, um, I will visit with my co-chair. We've got a couple of other things on our schedule today um, to decide whether or not this will start on the House or Senate side. Um, with that, committee members, it is um, 11 o'clock. We are wildly behind schedule, which I had a feeling might happen today. Um, I would like to hear, since we have Department of Tourism on the line, an explanation of their budget item. 
After that, take a break and then pick up on the Bozeman Trail discussion and then try and um, start pushing through the rest of our agenda items. So if Department of Tourism is still on the line and would like to do that presentation right now, I think that'd be appropriate and we'd appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chairman, with your permission, I'll go through this and I will be brief. Sounds um, good, thank you. You're welcome. Um, may I have permission to share my screen so that you all can see the handout that we sent to you? Yes, thank you. And committee members, I don't think this is um, new. If you were watching appropriations, um, this you, you'll be familiar with this discussion, but um, we're just doing our due diligence to make sure we understand how the budget presentation went for Department of Tourism. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, what you see before you is actually a breakdown um, of page 13 in the agency 066 budget um, breakdown. And um, I put this together in somewhat standard terms that you may be familiar with, uh, but I just wanna go back and make sure that there's a uh, refreshing your memory that in January of 2020, you as a body, uh, the, the full legislature passed a statewide lodging tax of 5%. 3% of that went into um, two special funds, while 2% went back to the county or the locale in which it was collected for local efforts. So of the 3%, 80% went into an account for the Wyoming tourism account. And that is what I'm referring to right now that you see at the top of your screen. The other 20% went into the Wyoming Tourism Reserve and Project Account. And that is a one-time, um, or, or, or maybe implied to be one-time funding. And that is where the recommended source of funds are for the film production incentive that you just reviewed. So just to lay that out, to give you some context and some background. Uh, so if you're looking at what I have in front of you, and you also should have this as a handout, uh, when the Office of Tourism, as we are today, on the general fund would have had a standard budget of $22,444,704 on the biennium. And so for the first time ever, we um, asked the appropriations committee to allow us to go off of the general fund and move this standard budget appropriation to be funded out of the Wyoming tourism account. And so that would be all of the items that we've been doing for um, over 50 years uh, within that Wyoming tourism account. And that includes advertising, some destination marketing work and our office and administration. We then had a, um, an additional request in order to move and grow the visitor economy. There's two priorities within this. One is to um, actually grow our visitation in a responsible way bringing the right tourists to the right places at the right time. And so within that, an additional 8.8 .8 million, and you uh, just reminding you that these are on biennium numbers. And so that would include some marketing work, storytelling, content development. Uh, one of our goals is just to disperse visitors to lesser known locales throughout the state. And this would allow us to generate more in uh, production and storytelling about all the places that there are across Wyoming. The, uh, the, the next initiative, number three, destination development, is helping to build visitor ready communities. And so if we want to disperse visitors to more places across the state of Wyoming, what is there for them to see and do that would hold the visitors within that location? And many times there's great product that's out there, but maybe there's not wayfinding or uh, maybe there isn't a visitor services uh, that's running you know, to help visitors guide them. And so this is a comprehensive evolution of the work that we've been doing called Why Best um, for destination development. More than about 70% uh, of Wyoming lodging tax boards have completed their Why Best work. And it's really about strategic planning and helping them move forward. It's also done in conjunction with the University of Wyoming the Business Council, State Parks and Cultural Resources, Wyoming Game and Fish, uh, State Lands, to really encompass all of these components for product development at the local level. Uh, four is for enhanced digital platforms. Uh, technology and digital platforms are our information highway. And this was an approved budget line item through ETS. 
uh, to just build onto those and continue to evolve those. One thing that I think would be of importance and interest to this particular committee is a few years ago, you funded the Division of State Parks Outdoor Recreation Office to build an interactive outdoor recreation map. And we have done that collectively together. And that sits actually in travelwyoming.com. And part of this fund is to continue to evolve that, add more product, uh, continue to enhance how easy it is for visitors to access this and go through it. Um, items five and six are, uh, well, I just wanna go back and say items five and six, the majority of our advertising goes directly to consumers through um, all kinds of broad spectrum medium. But we also do direct sales for um, wholesalers and suppliers and tour operators. And line items five and six are to revive those direct sales efforts um, that basically uh, fell down during the pandemic. And we also use those as part of our budget reductions because we simply weren't doing activities. There wasn't a demand for that product. But many of our businesses across Wyoming rely on this kind of travel trade, um, middleman to sell our product. And um, in, the, um, in the Reviving International, that also includes all of our work that's done in a five-state cooperative with Idaho, Montana, North, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And the next item was interagency support and collaboration. Uh, the Department of Transportation uh, it, we have an MOU with them for operations and administration, excuse me, operations and maintenance of the Northeast and the Southeast Wyoming Welcome Center. Uh, those have not been adjusted since 2010. And we wanted to add 200,000 um, annually, 400,000 on a biennium to that work. We wanted to shift 50,000 on a biennium to Wyoming State Fair um, to add to their marketing program and to add 800,000 to the Office of Outdoor Recreation. The Office of Outdoor Recreation was established in 2018, but did not have a funding source. And now that there are resources available, uh, we wanted to be able to help support that office. We have a vested interest in having a fully functioning, fully funded outdoor recreation office. Item number eight, Enhancing Team Wyoming. I hope all of you are familiar uh, with this program. There was a legislative appropriation uh, years back, and that has been eroded to some degree over time due to budget restrictions. Uh, but this involves professional cowboys uh, doing social media and ambassador work for the state of Wyoming, but it also involves the rodeo teams at seven community colleges in the University of Wyoming, and we would like to make this, pro this project and this initiative whole. And so we're asking for 220000 and then just some additional operations and administration, mostly for some licenses for uh, development, um, 62,000. That would bring the total request of that operating fund, revenue fund, 1275 to 39.2 million. And then out of the tourism reserve and project account, uh, 1.5 million for renovation, renovations and enhancements at state operated welcome centers. Uh, also to uh, an opportunity to provide pop-up information centers at remote areas, like maybe some remote historic sites or other areas. Item number 11, to work with the University of Wyoming Community Colleges through the WORTH Project. The WORTH Project stands for Wyoming Outdoor Recreation, Tourism and Hospitality in order to uh, address our workforce issues at a very systemic level. Uh, this would include scholarships and, and an industry match in order to be able to release these funds and then 12, you would see in um, Agency 24, um, a like item for a spending authority from this account for 2 million for product development and grants for the outdoor recreation collaboratives, et cetera. And so that is a quick uh, Reader's Digest version of this budget. And out of respect for time, I'll be following up with each of you individually um, after this meeting. And if you want to go through this, I will be happy to do that with you. Um, I know that you probably all have a lot of questions. It's an exciting time to grow the visitor economy um, and to look at the ways in which um, we can best utilize uh, the revenues that are generated from the statewide lodging tax. And with that, Madam Chairman, I'll stop sharing and would entertain any questions. Or if you want me just to 
uh, follow up with the committee, I'm more than happy to do so. Committee members, um, if you have a question for Director Schober, please show me your virtual hand so I can gauge how many questions we're going to take. So far, I just see Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Diane, what are collections? I know we started um, collecting statewide lodging tax in January. What are those collections looking like now? Um, Madam Chairman and Representative Newsom, the, um, the collections in the Wyoming tourism account, let me see if I can get this up and um, uh, read it to you. Um, as of December 31st, and I remind you that this is only 12 months, we still have six months to go for the collections in this, um, in this biennium, which would be available starting July 1st, and then the projections for the next biennium. So in the collections in the Wyoming tourism account at the end of December, actual collections are 22.9 million, 22 million nine hundred and forty four thousand seven hundred and sixty three dollars. We are estimating based on those collections that the 18 month year end biennium year end but would have a total of 29 million two hundred and seventy seven thousand. 764. And then um, the 24 month, which would be in 23 and 24, if there were uh, at the same rate of collection, um, it would generate uh, 45.8 million. And if you look at page 13 of our uh, budget document, you would see the projections that were made on that account uh, when we submitted the budget in August and we sent some updated information to the Joint Appropriations Committee uh, with the data that was relevant as of 1231, I am happy to follow up with all of you and share that with you so you can see those uh, projections and where we are, uh, what our office is projecting. And we get all of these numbers from the Department of Revenue through their tax distribution reports. Further questions, Representative Sweeney? Thank you, Madam Chairman. So, Diane, that $22,944,000, does that include in that, that total number the uh, reserve and project, uh, special project account? Also, the so it's 80, 80 20, correct? 80%, 20%. Director Schober. Uh, Madam Chairman and uh, Representative Sweeney. The 22 million is in the, um, in the tourism account, which is the operating account. And in the reserve and project account, at the end of December, the collections are 5,736,189 dollars. We are projecting at the end of June, June 30th of 23, excuse me, 22, I'm getting ahead of myself, that that amount would be $7,319,439. And on a 24 month projection, that would be, which would include um, the collections that would happen in biennium that of uh, 23 and 24 would be $11,472,378. And again, I will forward what we updated the Joint Appropriations Committee to all of you so that you have that information. Okay, further questions for Director Schober? Seeing none, thank you, Director, for your presentation today. Um, I think I might make a note that as we look at um, you know, interim work for this upcoming year, maybe we can flesh out some of these ideas a little bit more fully um, throughout the year. And you know, I know this is a bit of a transition for the agency. Um, so thank you for making time to explain that to us today and committee members, you know, we've got budget work on the horizon. So if you have questions about tourism's budget, please reach out to Director Schober. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I will follow up with each of you individually uh, to go over this. So appreciate your time today. Thank you. With that, um, any public comments on the topic of Wyoming state tourism. I don't see anyone in the room. I don't think anyone's in the waiting room uh, online. There isn't. That part of our agenda is closed. 
We're now scheduled to take a 15 minute break. It is 1113. How about we come back here in 15 minutes? So um, at 1128, we'll pick up with the discussion on the Bozeman Trail and then get into some gaming issues. Thank you, committee members.
All righty, committee members, I believe we're back and we're live. Just a moment of levity. Um, there are three of us in the committee room in the Capitol building and um, we're not setting off the motion sensor. So sometimes the lights turn off on us. So if you see us waving our arms and jumping around, it's because um, we're apparently quiet as church mice in this room. So that's kind of fun. Um, Senator Landon, before we jump into our next topic. Well, Madam Chairman, uh, it sounds like you'll be jumping into the next topic, uh, literally, uh, as well as on the agenda. But uh, thank you. Uh, just a real quick announcement, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, again, committee, my apologies for the, um, the presentation not being included in your meeting materials. I had assumed that that had happened, and I should not have assumed that, but I have forwarded that to you. Uh, so you should have in your inbox uh, an email from me, which will include some information provided to me by construction uh, management as well. And that answers Representative Jennings' questions of this morning. How much are we into the state capital at this point? Uh, so I hope you find that useful. And regarding the project overview, I think that's a presentation that that you will enjoy. And I, I would um, be happy to answer any questions uh, later on, or if you wanna look me up during the session as that moves through. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for that follow-up, Senator Landon. Any other comments before committee, from committee members before we dive into trails? Seeing none, um, our next topic is uh, an update on the Bozeman Trail National Historic Trail designation effort. Um, on my list of presenters, you'll see on your agenda, we have Dave McKee, who's been um, leading this charge. We also have Tom Ray from the Oregon California Trails Association, and then Frank Moore, I believe a landowner in Wyoming, who would like to speak on this topic. Um, we are substantially behind on our calendar. And since we don't really have an official legislative um, ask at this point, as far as you know, supporting a bill, I would like to keep this presentation as short as possible. And before we um, hear from Mr. McKee along those lines, committee members in your packet, you will see a beautiful color copied um, version of a PowerPoint presentation about the National Historic Trails. A lot of this should look familiar to you. I think a lot of this information has already been covered in a prior hearing by Mr. McKee. So Mr. McKee had asked that you not go through this in any great detail anymore. In your meeting materials, you also have a copy of um, a Senate bill introduced in the US Congress 1112. Again, please read that. There's no need to go over that in great detail um, at this hearing. Um, but with that, let's try and keep our comments on and update. I guess what I'd really like to know is what additional outreach has been done with landowners. I think that's where we left off this discussion about the designation of this trail for the National Historic Trails List. So with that, um, let's hear from Mr. McKee, but um, again, please keep your comments brief. We are unfortunately very behind today on our agenda. He needs to unmute. I've done enough of these, I should have known that, but good morning, Madam Chairman and committee members. Thank you for your time today. Um, on our Bozeman Trail, National Historic Trail Initiative. Um, I will skip right to updates. Where we left it last time was uh, landowners. We had submitted out uh, about 260 letters with our information on the Bozeman National Historic Trail effort and about the National Trails Act uh, to landowners that um, based on our best research, um, had the Bozeman Trail crossing their property or near their property. And we specifically targeted, land, targeted landowners uh, that had 160 acres or greater. So targeting large landowners uh, for additional outreach, uh, contacted county commissioners in the, in the uh, appropriate counties with this information as well and news releases. I know there was uh, front page uh, news articles on our initiative, um, both in the Sheridan paper and in the Casper Star Tribune. So that was our outreach to our landowners uh, with information and a request to, uh, for people to contact us or to invite us to any meetings or gatherings so that we could um, 
talk about our knowledge and get their input. Um, we are following the National Trails Act, so it's a specific two-step process. What we're asking for is the feasibility study under which uh, the feasibility study team directed by the Secretary of Interior would have the study team um, do public meetings and establish a formal comment period so that they can determine whether uh, the trail is suitable for national listing and a key component of their study uh, through their public meetings and comment period is to measure public desirability for national historic trail. So we are hoping for the feasibility study um, that would be legislation passed by our US congressional delegation. If the team found it suitable, the second and separate step would be to go back to our congressional delegation and ask for the final legislation. Two uh, concerns were raised to us through public outreach. There was a lot of support to begin with, and we submitted to you uh, via email a list of organizations and a very small partial list of individuals who have submitted letters of uh, support for the feasibility study. So I would direct you to that email. Uh, two uh, issues that were brought up, um, particularly from landowners. The first one is simply uh, the potential for federal overreach through a National Historic Trail designation. Um, would direct you to one of the slides in the PowerPoint, but Section 3 of the National Trails Act specifically says that uh, management of the National Historic Trail uh, will only occur on public lands managed by a federal agency and not on private lands. The reason that I um, added the current legislation for the Chisholm Trail is because when they finished their feasibility study, they had uh, a same concern from their landowners having been born and raised in Kansas. Uh, I know that most of the Chisholm Trail crosses ran private ranch land, so same concern. And so what their Kansas delegation did was add additional specific strong language protecting private property rights in their final legislation. And we think that that would be a good model for us um, if we could get to that second step. For additional outreach, um, a second component we were working on at the time was outreach to tribal governments. Uh, their history is entwined uh, with the Bozeman Trail. So since we last spoke, we have hosted uh, meetings on site with the Tribal Historic Preservation Office staffs for the Northern Cheyenne and the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And we had very good productive visits with them, very educational. Probably most importantly was our outreach to the Crow Tribe. They have a significant chunk of the Bozeman Trail that crosses their lands. Um, and some of those uh, stretches are pristine intact segments. So they have uh, a vested interest in this project. We've stayed in constant communication with them. And last Friday, the historic preservation staff for the Crow came down and we met in Sheridan. And I would also say that was a very productive meeting. So we're hoping for letters of recommendation, um, particularly from the Crow tribe, the Northern Cheyenne, and any of the other uh, 10 tribes that we reached out to who might be able to benefit in terms of additional recreation um, and tourism. And also just to be able to include their histories as part of a uh, wide, uh, more well-rounded history of the events along the, the Bozeman Trail. Um, I know you're pressed for time. And uh, so I'm probably going to uh, stop there. I will, I will just reiterate, uh, our reasons for um, pursuing this, um, four key components. One, just as people who wanna preserve history and teach history, we think that the Bozeman Trail is worthy of National Historic Trail designation. It underscores, it bold faces, it stamps the importance of this trail for our Wyoming citizens, for current generations and future generations. 
Number two, we think designation will increase visitation and interest at our state sites and our local museums and increase revenue at our museums and sites. Uh, third, as a nonprofit organization, we think that National Historic Trail designation will strengthen the grant applications that we put in for in order to support operations at our state historic sites and to further our education um, efforts and programs. And then finally, with increased visitation um, and interest in the Bozeman Trail, we think that that will benefit local com communities with additional visitation and possibly longer visitation. If we were to get designation, our focus is education and travel to museums and sites of interest along the interstate corridor to sites that are staffed and museums and places like Fort, Fort Phil Kearney that we support um, that can provide that education and interpretation. Madam Chairman, that's my summary statement and I would yield back to you, thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. McKee? I have no one in the room that's here to testify. Thank you, Dave. We'll um, have you stand by in case we have any further questions that might arise. But thanks for your presentation today and thanks for your, your brevity. Um, I also have Tom Ray on my list. Tom, are you in the wait room? Yes. All righty, welcome. And um, if you could keep your comments to about three to five minutes, that would be great. But welcome and please identify yourself for the record. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. My name's Tom Ray. I'm the president of the Wyoming chapter of the Oregon California Trails Association. And I'm also editor of a Wyoming state history website called wyohistory.org, which is a project of the Wyoming State Historical Society. It's been online for 10 or 11 years. Um, the national group, the Oregon California Trails Association has been around since the early 1980s. It has chapters in 10 Western states and its mission is to um, preserve and educate people about the Western trails. Wyoming has some of the very best still, um, still existing trails in the nation. And we are very much in support of the, of the uh, Bozeman Trail Association's move to get uh, NHT, National Historic Trail status for the Bozeman Trail. The Oregon, California, Mormon Pony Express trails are all one road through Gasper where I live and, and through the middle of the state. And they've had this designation for decades and it works very well. We've never heard any complaints for landowners and what it enables, as you all know, uh, it just enables there to be better signage and better public information available about the trails. And it also enables um, federal help for people who want it to, uh, to better um, interpret and manage their historic sites. So the route of the trail would, goes from Douglas up past KC towards Buffalo and Story and, and local museums on that route that would definitely benefit from this designation and towns include um, the Fort Fetterman, um, the Hoof Prince of the Past Museum in KC, the Jim Gatchell Museum in Buffalo, uh, the historic sites and story around Fort Phil Kearney and the two battle sites there and the uh, Connor Battlefield Monument there in Ranchester. Um, the, it's, a, it's a wonderful stretch of country and it would be great to have it coherently all uh, designated. So that would be a great thing. The, one other thing I wanted to say just briefly was that the National Conference of the Oregon California Trails Association will be here in Casper this summer, late August and early September. And we're gonna be having, we're gonna be running bus tours up the Bozeman Trail and uh, Dave's gonna be helping us do this. And there'll probably be three or 400 people from around the West and around the nation at this conference. So I want just want to impress again on everyone that heritage tourism is a, is a real and important and steadily growing thing. The state tourism office has been more and more aware of this in recent years, and this is a good example of it. And we can help increase that with this, uh, with this designation for the Bozeman Trail. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Questions for Mr. Ray? I see Senator Landon. Madam Chairman, thank you. And uh, Tom, great to see you. Um, we go all the way back to uh, our writing days at the Star Tribune newspaper, and it's always good to see you. Thanks for your testimony. My question to you, Tom, is can, 
Can you remind us what the time frame looks like at the national level? Um, in the back of my mind, I'm sitting here this morning wishing that there was more that we could do at the state level to support this effort. Uh, what does it look like back uh, with our delegation back in, in Congress? Mr. Well, Ray? I, I think maybe Dave McKee could answer that better than I can, but it certainly takes years to get, uh, to get a uh, feasibility study approved. Is that right, Dave? And then uh, years beyond that, maybe. Mr. Madam, Chairman, Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, typically, uh, if legislation for a feasibility study is is successfully passed, it usually takes a minimum of two years for Interior to put the team together and begin the study. Uh, and one reason for that is the legislation directing them to do the feasibility study does not include funding, and so they need a year or so to uh, prioritize their work and use their appropriated dollars to do the work. So a couple of years for that, and then maybe two more years to work on and get final legislation. So if I was gonna give you my best guess, I would say a minimum of four years for the whole process. Follow-up question, Senator Landon. Thank you for that opportunity, Madam Chairman, and uh, Dave and Tom, I appreciate that. Uh, it sounds like, Madam Chairman, that we may still have time as we go forward to uh, uh, lend at least some token support, perhaps through a resolution next year or, or whatever, but um, really appreciate the information provided, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And along those lines, just to let the committee know, I did receive a note from Senator Boner, who, as you know, it lives in the Converse County area or lives in Converse County. He also chairs um, the joint ag, co-chairs the joint ag committee, as well as select federal natural resources you know, at some point, I do think that they'd like to be looped into this discussion as well to make sure that they're aware of the efforts. They have their members weighing in. Um, I'm suspecting you're going to hear a lot of the concerns um, that we've already talked about in this committee about um, federal overreach and, you know, how this designation could or impact energy development or ag production in Wyoming. So, um, you know, I don't know that we'll take any action today, but I just wanted to make it known that I did receive that correspondence from Senator Boner. So at some point we might loop in that committee. Um, I believe we had Frank Moore sign up to testify. Madam Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome back, Representative. Thank you. I appreciate the chance to talk to the committee. This is, um, I haven't got a lot of background on on the Bozeman Trail designation. And then Frank, uh, just for, I know most bit. people know who you are, but for our record, would you mind identifying yourself, please? Sorry about that. Frank Moore, um, rancher, Northwest Converse County, a former representative. Thank you, please proceed. Madam Chairman, uh, my concern is government overreach. Um, the, the National Historical Trails designation goes under the Secretary of Interior who has um, the ability to, for condemnation, if they feel like there's a parcel of private ground that needs to be utilized for this. Um, it's real easy for someone in Washington, DC to look at a piece of ground in way off Wyoming and only affecting one or two landowners and say, it's, it's for the better good. We should condemn this piece of ground and put it in as part of our whatever they need, an interpretation center or a viewing area or whatever. So I guess I have concerns about their ability to override anything that you put in there about private property rights. Um, also some concerns about oil and gas development. Uh, a few years back, I don't know what they're doing right now, but the Bureau of Land Management was requiring any new oil and gas uh, permit, it had to be invisible from the Bozeman Trail. Well, there are places on the Bozeman Trail that you can see for miles and miles. Um, uh, there's one area right above my brother's ranch where you can sit on the hill and you can see 10, 12 miles in any direction. And that very much limits oil and gas development. 
uh, not just along the Bozeman Trail, but a lot of other areas that are a, a long ways from the Bozeman Trail. So I guess while I think the Bozeman Trail is historically significant and important, um, we need to be careful of what what actually is going to happen if this thing gets designated as a historical trail. Um, I, as a landowner, don't recall any notice of this from the entity that's that's proposing it, but I'm not saying we never saw it or never got it, but we never recognized it as something that was in the works. That's all, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Moore? Seeing none, um, you know, we've got Mr. McKee and Mr. Ray on the, the Zoom. Um, this might be a good chance to connect you to Mr. Moore and maybe the two of you can hash out a time to answer some of those questions and get him up to speed on how legislation has been produced and other trail designations talking about issues like condemnation. And um, that might be a good, a good connection for you to make. This is Dave, Madam Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And uh, Frank, I would be delighted to talk to you, tell you what I've learned in my research. And uh, so I can give you my uh, phone number right now if you'd like to have it. How about we connect you to over email, make sure you've got your contact info. You don't need to do that. Perfect. Thank you so much. We'll Thank make you. those connections and then, you know, certainly provide an introduction to you to Senator Boner as well. I will send that email later today. Um, but uh, a trip over to Converse County, maybe talking about um, just some of those concerns and, and making sure that we're getting all effective landowners up to speed on the project. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I, I did uh, uh, reach out to the Petroleum Association of Wyoming uh, to see what they've heard um, uh, at this point. They don't believe that it's over onerous, um, no more than the BLM uh, already uh, and the federal government have constraints. Uh, but I, I do appreciate uh, Mr. Moore's comments and uh, uh, would appreciate if Tom and Dave would uh, try to get together because I know it's more than uh, just Mr. Moore's concerns. Uh, there's some large stakeholders in that area where the trail turns so um, um, and moves north, but uh, appreciate that. But I have talked to Petroleum Association and um, uh, they're, they're monitoring, but I think that's that's the extent of it at this point. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Representative Sweeney. Has there been anybody else? I don't think anyone else has signed up to talk on this topic. I don't see anyone else in our committee room. So thank you for that update, gentlemen. We'll follow up some emails, making sure you all can connect um, and have future discussion about how this might proceed. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is online sports wagering. You'll see we have um, two items we wanna visit about. One is a guy, um, man named Ryan Green with the Playsome Group wants to discuss a potential for Wyoming uh, carve out. Uh, you'll have some information in your reading materials. And the next topic is negative revenue carryover. This came up as a result of some discussions that occurred in joint appropriations earlier this month. Um, because this is our last committee meeting, we will not be sponsoring legislation that we haven't seen. So to the extent there's a legislative ask for a carve out, um, you know, certainly any individual legislator on this committee can listen to Mr. Green's presentation and introduce a private bill. But for purposes of today, we don't have legislation before us. So it's not something the committee can sponsor. Another um, alternative would be to look at the issue and decide whether or not we want to take it up as an interim topic for this upcoming year. So with that caveat, um, there's not a lot we need to do today as far as an action item. And so Mr. Green, um, if you're in the waiting room, please unmute yourself, identify yourself for the record. And if you could keep your presentation to five minutes or less, just so we can try and get back on our agenda and conclude our meeting, that would be great. 
Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. If I could have permission to share my screen, I do have a quick presentation. I will try to go as quick as I can. I cannot promise five minutes, but I will hustle. I'd like you to really pay attention to your clock, Mr. Green. Understood. Okay, let me share. Okay. Let's see, real quick, just getting things set up here. Okay, Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address you. I know that you have a lot of on your collective plate, so this time is appreciated. Uh, my name is Ryan Green. I live in Rock Springs, Wyoming, where I was born and raised. I'm a welder by trade. My wife, Lindsay, works in a public school, and we have two great kids that certainly deserve better Little League coaches than myself. Um, I serve on the Rock Springs City Council, or I did serve, and thanks to an appointment by Governor Gordon and Senate approval, I currently serve on the State Environmental Quality Council. During my career, I have helped my family construction business grow from one welding truck into a company that now operates in multiple states. And when I find the time, I'm a bit of an entrepreneur. Over the past uh, decade, I've built a couple of small businesses and a charitable organization. And it's that entrepreneurial side that brings me here today. Um, this morning, I'd like to speak about two things. One, online sports wagering, and two, supporting Wyoming entrepreneurs and small businesses. Now, as you know, the Wyoming legislature recently legalized online sports betting in Wyoming. House Bill 133 made Wyoming the 23rd state to join the industry, and it's a big industry. This year's domestic revenue is forecasted to hit $13.1 billion, and it's projected to grow 40% over the next decade. Now, it took a tremendous amount of hard work, negotiation, and compromise from lawmakers, stakeholders, all coming together to get House Bill 133 over the goal line. And the result, the result is, to be, uh, is something to be proud of. The statue is good, but with a little bit of work, it can be great. So here is an excerpt from House Bill 133, Section 1 definitions, quote, a qualified gaming entity means a gaming entity that offers online sports wagering through computers, digital platforms, or mobile applications in not less than three jurisdictions in the United States. So in plain, unquote, sorry, in plain terms, what that means is that a small Wyoming business cannot apply for a license or permit. This is the exact opposite of shop local. Now, it's, this is important because Wyoming has been a launch pad for many businesses, including my family's construction business. We started here in Wyoming 23 years ago, and now we operate in Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, Utah, and North Dakota. And we run a trucking division that is licensed in 48 states. But we probably couldn't have done it if we didn't start right here in Wyoming because Wyoming has the most ben, uh, business friendly climate in the region. But what if we had to operate in three other jurisdictions before Wyoming? I don't think we'd be as successful. So to be direct, three jurisdictions um, is not small business friendly. It locks local small businesses out of a new industry. Um, so just think about that, if a, if a Wyoming, citizen, an entrepreneur like myself wants to be a part of this booming industry, we have to open up shops in three other states first. So what if other shops had to open up uh, in three other states prior to Wyoming? What if the owners of Taco John's had to meet the same standard? Taco John's has hundreds of locations and thousands of employees. And Mr. And Green, we try and refrain from using proper names and other I, I, companies. I, I think uh, we got your point. Understood, yeah. And, and, and as well as others um, have started right here and been very successful in Wyoming. Um, so skipping ahead, it also, HB 133 locks out local businesses in competition. It limits competition. And as a small businessman, um, I've learned a thing or two about the economy. 
And firsthand, I've learned that competition is good for the economy. When Wyoming, when businesses compete, customers win. And the more businesses compete, customers win big. Competition leads to innovation. Prices go down and the quality of service goes up. Competition also drives economic growth. And I know a few of you have businesses and can relate to what I'm saying. The law should encourage competition, not just hand things over to the giants of this industry. And on that note, currently the only three betting licenses that are approved by the Wyoming Gaming Commission have gone to the largest online sports betting operators in the nation. DraftKings headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts, BetMGM headquartered in New Jersey, and FanDuel has recently been approved and are headquartered in New York, New York. A few months ago, according to Front Office Sports, some of these competitors tried to buy the other competition for an estimated $20 billion. Now this doesn't look like a competitive industry to me, but another drawback um, to this industry is that Wyoming sends its sports betting revenues to the East Coast. We're cutting out the small Wyoming business businessman, but we're propping up the big boys on the East Coast. Now, I don't know anyone in Wyoming that would say that this is the right way to do business. You know, some folks call Wyoming the equality state, others call it the cowboy state, but I've never heard it referred to as the East Coast patron state. And I've never heard elected officials campaign with a slogan that says, elect me, I promise to support large East Coast businesses. It's a uh, so now more than ever, I believe that Wyoming needs to give local businesses, local entrepreneurs, as many opportunities as possible. And we need to keep as many dollars in Wyoming as we can. Year in and year out, our state faces down deficits tied to education spending. Our legislature debates, debates, debates how and how much to cut K through 12 education funding. And I know I'm not the only one that thinks that we owe the next generation at least what we had growing up, if not more. Now, I understand and that we're this- we're at five minutes, Mr. Green. Could you wrap up your comments, please? Yes, yes. Um, let me just skip ahead here. Our solution, what we're asking for, and we, I understand that we do not have a um, legislative item or amendment in front of the TRW committee, and I, I do understand it's, it's uh, too late to come as a, a sponsored amendment, but what we're simply asking for is to level the playing field. And in the upcoming session, we have put to, together some legislation, an amendment that um, simply put will authorize the Wyoming Gaming Commission to uh, um, provide a conditional use permit. So we would not be changing the three jurisdictions or anything um, with this, the actual amendment. It would just be authorizing them for a conditional use permit. That would allow a Wyoming owned and operated sports book to be up and running, um, but also answer some concerns. Within this conditional permit, what we are proposing- Mr. Mr. Green, I'm gonna cut you off there. Committee members, you're welcome to ask Mr. Green any questions right now, but I'd remind you that um, if you'd like to sponsor a bill that would do what Mr. Green is requesting, um, you're welcome to do that as an individual legislator. We can make sure you have his contact information. Um, and I would encourage you, you know, we have a, we're behind on our agenda significantly. Committee members, are there any questions for Mr. Green? Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I, I, I feel badly that we're not able to discuss anything, but um, I, I would like to hear the rationale from the Gaming Commission or, or today, the Paramutual Commission on um, what they think about this um, that I do feel is relevant to, to our committee, but uh, if that's not possible and no one's on from the gaming commission. You know, Representative Sweeney, just to take a crack at it, I think the discussion was if we're gonna have sports betting in Wyoming, how do we make sure that we've got reputable operators um, conducting those bets? And so I believe that was the policy decision for requiring that, you know, if the in, or that entity operates in three other jurisdictions, that they're most likely a reliable, trustworthy operator. Um, you know, because we're not taking 
action on this today, you know, would certainly encourage anyone to visit with the original bringer of the bill, uh, you know, Representative Walters sponsored that legislation. Um, but for purposes of today, I just wanted you to be aware of the ask and we afforded Mr. Green that pretty extraordinary opportunity to testify, um, you know, at the finish line when we're wrapping up our interim work. You know, certainly we can look at legislation again brought by individuals or if this rises to the level of an interim topic, it's a place marker for you to, to raise that issue for the 2022 session. Looks like we've got Senator Landon on the phone or on raising his hand. Madam Chairman, real quickly, I just wanted to make sure Mr. Green knew that he could reach out to uh, not only his local legislators, uh, but to anybody on the committee. Um, and uh, our emails are right there on the legislative website. And if you feel like that's something we can get to the finish line with in a very busy 20 day budget session, uh, I'm sure that there are legislators who are willing to yeah. to lean in, and I would I would probably entertain that um, and, and try to do what I could to help. So thank you, Madam Chairman, and appreciate the information from Mr. Green. Madam thank Chairman, you. any I other questions from committee members? Mr. Green, briefly. Yes, briefly. Um, so where we are at today is I have spoke with Representative Tom Walters. Um, we understood that this would be a, a tremendous ask going into this budget session with changing this amendment. So we do have legislation that I will get out in front of all of you guys. It, um, it is, we understand we're up against the time frame, but basically the legislation is just to um, allow the Wyoming Gaming Commission to give a conditional use permit for two years under um, guide, uh, a set of guidelines that provide consumer protections and those other um, aspects of, uh, you know, to, to make sure the legislature feels good about doing that. And I've spoken with David Carpenter about that with the Wyoming Gaming Commission as well. And he was going to be here today to speak on behalf of that, but um, must not have made it. But I will reach out to the, this committee and get that in front of all of you and then uh, welcome all your comments and feedback. All righty, if you have um, more further interest in this topic, Mr. Carpenter, do you have some brief remarks? I'm trying to get us, we're really behind schedule at this point. We haven't even started our gaming discussion in earnest, we've got a lot on our agenda. What comments can I, would you like to Thank offer you, on Madam this topic? Um, yeah, I just wanted to chime in real quick. I did speak with Mr. Green and, you know, one thing I'll just mention to you guys is that um, the the fees in other jurisdictions range anywhere from another 100,000 on up to $10 million to get some of these guys in. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing I just wanted to touch on with this jurisdictions is it does also have that effect on tribal and then there's kind of some some international realms to it too where we do allow for exchange wagering however no other jurisdiction in the united states does allow for that and so then it it kind of gets fallen by the wayside based on this three jurisdiction rule um also there's blockchain competitors that are looking to enter the market as well um and we're one of the only states that has that regulatory framework in place right now to handle such things so I just wanted to touch on those and I'm open for questions. Thank you, questions for Mr. Carpenter. Alrighty, thank you. With that, oh, we'll close unless there's, I don't think there's anyone signed up in the wait room. Does anyone in the room wanna talk about um, the three jurisdiction limitation for sports betting? No, seeing none, that's closed. The next item on our agenda is negative revenue carryover. And to give the committee some context, I believe that the Wyoming Gaming Commission, I know you're calling yourselves the Paramutual Commission, hopefully we'll get that remedied um, with the Scrivener's error correction. If not, the Wyoming Paramutual Commission it is. Um, about negative revenue carryover, and this issue came up before appropriations. If you could explain to us what's going on just so we can keep up to date on whether or not legislative changes need to be made I've reviewed the letter, but I think it would be helpful for this committee to understand what net um, negative revenue carryover is and whether or not this was discussed um, when the legislation authorizing sports betting was going through the process. And so um, if you could give us an overview of the letter and what policy changes we need to be considering, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so long story short, when you have those promotional bet wagers or promotional plays and then free bets, um, for one, that allows each of these new, new entries into the market to um, start to build up their patron base. 
and um, it, it's a good thing. It brings brings the patrons out of the out of the illegal markets and into the legal markets that are now regulated by the Wyoming Paramutual Commission. Um, in doing so, you know that that very first month is when it is when it really takes effect. Um, you know, as they're trying to bring new entrants into their particular app. And um, what we've seen so far is that both of our operators did go into negative revenue in their very first month um, operating. And then every month subsequent to that, they have had positive revenues from there on out. And so I think generally speaking, this is gonna be a one-time type deal in that first month when those free bets and promotional plays are real, real active. Um, everything since then has been, been great. Um, and I do want to just say that um, total combined, our negative revenues amounted to um, about 12000 in taxes in that first month. Um, so not a large number. Um, that said, it, you know, there will be, as we get more operators, that, that number will go up a little bit. Um, you know, in the future, there could be times when this could, back, could come back up. Um, but it wouldn't be relevant to necessarily the promotional or free plays. Um, as an example, as an example, there was a NBA game where one of our operators kind of got um, caught behind behind the news stories of, the, of that moment, and um, they took a pretty bad beat on an NBA game. And so, if there was a real a real hard hit on a single a single bet. Um, where they just took a really large loss, then you could eventually see some sort of loss again. But generally speaking, I think it's going to be a one-time deal on that first month. Okay, questions for Mr. Carpenter? I think Senator yeah. Landon, did you have your hand up? Madam Chair, no, I did not. Okay, I see Senator Guru and Representative Sweeney. We'll do them in that order. Rep Senator Guru. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just quickly, um, and it sounds like this is something that either the commission or we need to work on, but to be perfectly honest, I don't understand why this is our problem. I, I, I mean, these companies know what they're doing. They're, they're putting out these specials, and I'm a businessman. I, I remember losing as much money as I did the first five years I was in business, and no taxpayers helped me out with that. So I'm just wondering what this has to do with us as far as, you know, should we just be looking at some sort of, you know, some sort of fix because if they're, you know, trying to encourage customers to come, that's smart and that's their business, but I don't think we should be paying for that. Or, are, or is that what's on the table here? Senator Greer, I think that's the question. Mr. Mm -hmm. Carpenter. Not so. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Greer. Um, you know, I think when the rules were drafted, it wasn't, you know, there's a there's a definition of online sports revenue, and that is what I take into account when we do this calculation on the taxes. Um, and I, I calculate that down to a T. The only difference is after that, we do allow for that negative carryover into the next month. And um, where it came into play um, in the rules is is just looking at the other jurisdictions, which was a part of the statute as it was written, is is that we were essentially required to take a look at these other jurisdictions and try to try to mirror what other states were doing. Um, it's, it's pretty commonplace across the industry. Not every state has done it, but um, a significant number of states have allowed for this negative revenue carry, carryover. So Mr. Carpenter, is it fair to say, I mean, you gave us this letter and in here you talk about the fact that under the act, that online sports wagering revenue is defined as the total of all wagers placed, which excludes free wagers and promotional play, minus all payments to patrons and minus any applicable federal excise taxation. So I think that's where the concern is, Senator Guru, is if they're offering a hundred dollar free play to a player, and we're that's written off um, under that definition of what we consider revenue, are we somehow subsidizing? those promotions. Um, and then the other part of my question along those lines is, you in this letter gave us a list of states, Virginia, Michigan, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, and Louisiana that all explicitly in their statutes authorize negative carryover. 
but Wyoming's, uh, to my understanding, it's not in the, your um, letter, but I think it's in the statute. We don't specifically authorize it. So I think that's where, is there confusion in, within the Gaming Commission over whether or not it has this authority? Because I think our desire in adding language that says, you know, mirror what other states are doing was to give you some flexibility, but unless it's specifically authorized, is that where the rub is? Can you explain that to me? Madam Chair, um, there were, some of those states are, are based on the rules. Some of the states are based on statute and rules. Um, and I, I had broken that down originally and then we ended up removing it. Um, what we've done since, since we started this discussion with Representative Stith is ask the Attorney General's office to review our authority over this matter. Um, you know, I think there's, there's questions remain and, and I hope that with the Attorney General's office help, we can get to the bottom of this and, and figure out, you know, a direction that we would like to go and um, also give you guys some feedback on that as well. Thank you. I might have a follow-up question, but I see we have Representative Sweeney and then Representative Jennings with their hands up. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So, David, um, I, I guess I, at this point, don't think there's really any action for us um, in, um, until you get the review from the Attorney General um, once once that's happened, if if we need to go back in and do some sort of uh, statutory change, um, I would hope that we that the commission would consider being able to do it by rule um, because it's basically already happened. So um, I, I I don't find any fault in the I. I think you guys have done a heck of a job trying to get this stood up. And uh, so I think unless I'm missing something here, there's really no ask at this point. Representative Sweeney, this is your, your chair of the day. I don't think there is an ask. I think it's an oversight responsibility. So we're understanding what some critical discussions were occurring on in appropriations last week. And to the extent that the gaming bill, the online sports wagering bill needs to be amended, just educating the committee on where there's maybe some confusion in the statute. Uh, Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I'd just like to, I'd like to see this type of thing go forward. And I'd like to suggest to the committee and the committee members that maybe we could look back for a framework to help this industry out with this negative we could call it maybe the Wyoming Gambling Economic Incentive, and maybe someone would like to run a bill to kind of solve some of that negative revenue. Uh, I think they'd have a framework for that. So I just wanted to throw that out. Thanks so much. I think that was Representative Jennings' attempt at some humor. Well appreciated. Um, but along those lines, uh, that's the central question is, do the statutes as they exist authorize negative revenue carryover? So we'll see how that shakes out. Any other questions for Mr. Carpenter? Is there anyone in the room that wants to testify on this issue? Is there anyone online? I believe we had a few on my list. I just wanna make sure we're not excluding anyone. Madam Chairman, can I just explain one more thing real quick? Please. Um, what I wanted to touch on real fast is with that promotional and free bet, I just wanted to explain how that revenue works um, for you guys to understand that. Um, so if there's a hundred dollar free bet and that hundred dollar free bet is lost by the patron, then that hundred dollars transfers over into the operator revenue and is in, then taxed the same as it would otherwise. Um, so it basically is kind of negated at that point. And then if it was a hundred dollar free bet that was won and say the, you know, the, it was plus 140 and so the patron won $140. Normally, if that was a cash bet, they'd get 240, they'd get the 140 that they won, and then they'd also get the $100 that they wagered. Uh, with, with the free bet, that $100 would go back into revenue just the same as if it were lost. And the only payout from the operator side would be that $140 winning. And so, so the free bet kind of zeroes itself out into revenue and is then 
added back into that taxable revenue. I hope that clarifies. It does. And I think you covered that in your letter. Can you explain how much money has online sports wagering generated as far as the statute lays out? How much revenue has it generated since it went live in September? Um, I believe we've collected about $90,000 in taxes. So about nine, 900,000 in, in online sports wagering revenue as it's defined in the statute. 90,000 you said? Yep. For September, October, November, and December, four months? Yes. Okay. Was there anything for September? Um, it was a minus 120,000 in, in taxable online sports wagering revenue. When you get a which, chance- which equaled a negative 12,000 is how we calculated it. When you get a chance, can you send us that, those numbers of how it broke out per month? Yes, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Carpenter? Thank you for your time today. Yep. And then just to go through the list, we had um, Dave Pickard, if needed, Mr. Pickard on the, in the weight room. Madam Chair, we have Sam Chadwick with Buddy Bet. Oh, yeah, we did have Mr. Chadwick from Buddy Bet. And this may have um, gone to the prior discussion on qualified gaming entity. Mr. Chadwick, you had signed up. I apologize that we didn't get to you sooner. If you need to revisit the prior subject, that's fine. Are you in there? Mr. Chadwick, if you're there, please turn on your computer, um, your microphone and your video. And if not, we'll move on. Sorry, I'm here. Okay. Welcome. Were you wanting to talk about this issue with negative revenue carryover? Or did you want to talk about the something else, the qualified gaming entities, the three jurisdiction limitation? Yeah, look, I, I, I don't want to talk about um, the topic necessarily that's just been covered. Um, I think David spoke to that quite clearly. Um, I, I, I take it that our submission has been, or our letter has been read. Um, and then if you could identify yourself for the record, and if you can, we're really behind on our agenda. So if you could keep your testimony to about five minutes, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Sure. Um, Sam Chadwick, Chief Commercial and Legal Officer for Buddy Bit Group Proprietary Limited. We are an Australian-based exchange wagering provider um, who is has launched in Australia and very keen to, to uh, start operations in, in the US. And we're very excited by uh, the progressive uh, structure that Wyoming has created. Um, at the moment, the U three U US jurisdictional requirement um, in under the Wyoming online sports wagering statute prohibits operators such as us from um, entering into the Wyoming market and we want to launch uh, through Wyoming. The, the challenge with the three US jurisdiction requirement is that you need to be licensed obviously in three other US jurisdictions Exchange wagering at the moment is is uh, hasn't been licensed in many US states, so by very nature of that makes it very difficult for us to commence operations in Wyoming. And for the same reason that the submission has been provided in relation to uh, the place and group from Wyoming, it also restricts local Wyoming operators from from uh, commencing operations in Wyoming because having to be licensed in three other US jurisdictions restricts that. So. Our proposal is, um, and ultimately, the economic benefit of Wyoming would be supported if the three US jurisdiction um, requirement was removed. There is quite a robust and, and comprehensive licensing process under the, under the statute that should um, suffice and satisfy the state of Wyoming in, in, in terms of ensuring that whoever they're licensing is uh, a bona fide qualified gaming entity, um, just like in every other major jurisdiction in the world. Um, if our proposal is in two parts, um, essentially the first proposal is to, to remove the US jurisdiction requirement entirely and instead rely on the license and permit application process as used in other reputable regulated jurisdictions in the world. The major um, you, uh, gambling jurisdictions in the world, such as Malta, Australia, um, the UK, all just require and, and rely on its license application process. 
if Malta can, if Wyoming, if Wyoming continues with its three year restriction requirement, um, it's going to uh, delay the economic benefit of the state. Alternatively, if uh, the state of Wyoming is not willing to remove a jurisdiction requirement in totality, we would suggest that replacing the US jurisdiction requirement with three reputable regulated jurisdictions, uh, which would include uh, markets such as Australia, the US, uh, sorry, Australia, UK, Malta, et cetera, which are established in reputable um, regulated jurisdictions. Obviously, this will, will generate significant economic benefit for the state of Wyoming. In Australia, for example, um, the, smallest state, one of the smallest state in Australia, the Northern Territory, um, commenced uh, regulating gaming before other states and they're still uh, benefiting from that economic benefit now where all the major gambling operators, exchange wagering providers have offices and staff um, in that jurisdiction, and we believe that the same would apply to Wyoming um, if it's if it uh, removed this US jurisdiction requirement and made it easier for um, uh, reputable um, gaming operators to commence operations in Wyoming. There's obviously a, a local economic benefit as well because it enables local Wyoming businesses who just, just want to operate in the state of Wyoming to to do so. Um, and most importantly, I think it's um, the, the application process itself um, within the sports wagering statute outlines the license application process for qualified gaming entities. Um, and that is largely consistent with major gambling operating regulated application processes in other jurisdictions. And it should be sufficient in its own right. Um, lastly, uh, I, I would just like to say that, that in a particular example in relation to, to our operation, which is um, consistent obviously with with others who have been licensed in, in in other jurisdictions to be able to go through a significant licensing application process in key markets such as Australia the UK Malta Ontario for example um, it does show that uh, that we have met all the requirements in those jurisdictions in its own right so if if you aren't minded to remove the jurisdiction jurisdiction requirement in its entirety um, Replacing that with three reputable jurisdictions um, globally, um, in our view, would, would suffice. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chadwick. I'll any, open questions, any questions? Any questions for Mr. Chadwick? I think you heard the prior discussion. There might be a, an individual bill met or in, introduced. Representative Walters was very involved in crafting the online sports wagering original legislation. Suggest reaching out to him, Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So do other other states, the these other 22 states, um, also not have a uh, uh, US jurisdictional um, portion of, of their individual online sports wagering uh, statutes? Correct, Mr. yeah. Mr. Chadwick. That's correct. Um, other states don't have this this jurisdictional requirement. Um, uh, there are other US states that haven't um, regulated the exchange wagering expressly like Wyoming has. Um, and we believe that is going to be of economic benefit for Wyoming and being progressive and catching up with the rest of the world. Um, exchange wagering is licensed and regulated in most um of the regulated gambling markets in the world, but in relation to the US, to your question, no, other US states don't have such a requirement, but many of them have not um, expressly authorised exchange wagering yet, which therefore makes it difficult for an operator such as us, who is an exchange wagering operator, we are unable to then have the licences in three other US states to then meet the US jurisdiction requirement in Wyoming. Um, and so um, it's inevitable that, that that the US states will license for exchange wagering and the fact that Wyoming has done so um, is fantastic and we, we want um, we want to commence operations in Wyoming, but we also want Wyoming to enjoy the economic benefit of that um, and the three US jurisdiction requirement prohibits that. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Chadwick? Thank you for your testimony today. Okay, just to confirm, there's no one else in the online, or excuse me, in the weight room wants to talk about online gaming or sports wagering, no? Okay, anyone in the public wanna talk about online sports wagering? I don't see you. 
So with that, that topic is closed. We'll keep monitoring and see how um, our attorney general's office interprets the statutory authority um, to do negative revenue carryover. The last item on our agenda is skill-based amusement games. And you'll see that um, there were two bills on the agenda that, were, that got on there rather late. And I wanna to apologize to everyone for that. At the end of our last hearing, I had offered to put together a work group of stakeholders and legislators to try and work through some possible amendments to skill-based amusement games. In all candor, the more I thought about it, um, the more I felt really daunted by the task. Um, we right now have all of our gaming statutes are in the Department of Ag's title, the agricultural title, because of its origins with historic horse racing or with, um, excuse me, live paramutual horse racing. And so as I thought about it, it seemed to me to make some sense to try and find a better home for the gaming commission. Should that be in the revenue title or the administration of government title? And as I started thinking about what that would mean to consolidate and move all of those statutes over and really do the work that I think would probably this statute probably needs, it just became overwhelming and certainly not something that we were authorized to do during the interim and something that LSO staff, I think, thought it would be really unfair to ask that of them. Along those lines, I just want to lament the fact that we are trying to stand up a new regulated entity. And we asked as a committee for further discussion on skill-based amusement games, our management committee uh, council said no. And so we've been, our hands have been really tired, I think, to give this the attention and follow-up that we've needed to. But I'm still really perplexed by where we are today. A recap, last year we passed Senate File 56, which made permanent the enhance, or excuse me, the existence of skill-based amusement games in Wyoming. And at that time I had worked with um, two of the largest vendors that comprise 95% of the market to develop Senate file 56. And in visiting with those entities, I heard consistently that there was not an, a, a desire at the time to try and expand or authorize new games in the state. In large part, because a lot was at stake. There was a sunset included in the original authorizing bill that only authorized these games to exist for about a year. And that was the concern. What if the legislature wanted to pull the plug on the whole enterprise? There was a lot of focus on making sure those games could stay in the state permanently. So that's what Senate File 56 sought to do. And in presenting the bill to my House colleagues and conversations with my Senate colleagues, I was asked the question repeatedly, does this add, um, authorize expanded skill games in the state? And I in earnest said, no, I've been working with the industry and I picked up where the TRW committee left off. This just gets rid of the sunset. And so here we are in January. And we've heard lots of discussion from the Gaming Commission and from those operators saying, no, no, Senate File 56 authorized expansion. And, you know, we can have all the attorneys in the state of Wyoming and beyond dissecting that language and coming up with their interpretations. But I offer to you that as someone who worked on that bill extensively, who really put my neck out there to make those games permanent, that I feel like um, my position has been misrepresented. I want to make it clear that that's not what I intended to do when I worked on that bill last year. And so that's why you see these two working drafts ahead of you that clarify that history, that clarify that intent. When I had spoke to one of the lobbyists for one of the skill-based amusement game vendors, I asked, um, you know, when did you come to this realization that Senate File 56 and your interpretation um, actually authorized or demanded that the Gaming Commission write rules to expand? And the answer I got was, well, the day after the governor signed it. Committee members, I'm bringing you this bill because I think expansion is a very important issue for the state. One that I think the legislature gets to set the policy on, one that we get to decide, not one that we accidentally have because it was an oops, we didn't catch it until after it was signed into law. So you'll see 22 LSO 384 working draft number five, which allows for expansion, and 22 LSO 372 draft point four, which says there's no expansion. Um, I think right now the default position for, of many is that um, even if the legislature does nothing, that the Gaming Commission must proceed with authorizing rules that allow for expanding. And I would disagree with that. I don't think the default is expansion. I think that that is something that the industry, if they want it, needs to affirmatively ask the legislature. So that's the purpose of having these two draft bills before you committee. I don't have a preference on which one we work, whether or not we work either of them. Um, but I really want to set the record straight because at the end of the day, we only have our word. 
And the word that I gave to my colleagues when I presented Senate File 56 was that it did not authorize expansion, period. That's how I presented the bill. And to the extent that people want to disagree with that, with their legal interpretation, that's fine. But this is, I'm telling you what my intention was and what my word was when I visited with colleagues. So with that, I'm happy to entertain any discussion by committee members of whether or not you want to take up either or neither of these bills. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> so first off, um, it would have helped if Madam Chairman would have said that a month or two ago as far as uh, your stress over the working group because I thought we could have a discussion not, not about um, totally going in and, and revamping things, uh, but I thought that's what the working group was gonna be. So in my mind, these, these two, I saw them for the first time on Friday, maybe some saw them differently. Um, and, uh, um, I personally, I don't think it's appropriate that we look at either one of them today, but um, I'll, I'll weigh in on that later. But um, uh, I appreciate your, the chairman's uh, explanation and why we're here. And, uh, but uh, that, that's my feeling. Uh, Representative Sweeney, your, your critique and your criticism is well placed. And I'm really sorry. Um, I just remind the committee we're citizen legislators and um, I've grappled over this issue for two months now, easily. Laying in bed at night thinking about what we should do. Should we do nothing? Um, and so this is not ideal by any stretch. And I wanna apologize for that. Senator Guru. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I too wanna share representatives Sweeney's sentiments, and um, I uh, I understand how, you, how the chair's feelings and, and how you and how you put this, but to be honest, and with all due respect, um, I I just wish you would have brought us into those those uh, conversations that you were having with yourself late at night in the working group. Not that I was a part of it, and just have those conversations and so we could all work together. But now here we are um, at the 11th hour and the 59th minute and and now we have these bills and I too um, just got them on Friday. And frankly, I haven't had a chance, I've looked at them, but I haven't had a chance to really go over it. So, and I don't, I too understand the confusion about did we ex want to expand gaming or didn't we? I understand that very deeply because when we passed 56, um, with the way that went through the legislature, yeah, there were a lot of unknowns about that bill and we took a leap of faith and it turned out that it wasn't quite what we thought it was. So I'm certainly willing to hear anyone else's, my other um, colleagues on this one, but uh, I wanna hear a little more conversation if anybody wants to hear it, but I'm ready to make a motion to table both these bills. Thank you. Any other comments before? And I don't know that that's necessary. If no one's going to move it, then no one's going to move it. Um, Senator Landon. Madam Chairman, thank you. And um, not in any way, shape or form to pile on. And um, uh, just want to offer some respect in your direction, because I know this is uh, near and dear and you've put a lot of time and effort already uh, into this particular area of the world. Um, but I just, you know, just from a, from a decorum and professionalism and interim work kind of level, um, it really doesn't fit today very well. Um, I would personally not be uh, comfortable voting for a committee to sponsor these bills today because I simply haven't had a chance to vet them. I haven't had an opportunity to reach out to my constituent groups, uh, to, to business people in, our, in my community, or uh, to even have a conversation in the hall with all of you. So uh, I just simply don't think we're ready for prime time on these. Um, 
that has, uh, you know, uh, you know, further, I, I think that if, if we do choose to bring those as an individual bill, I think, um, uh, you know, leadership may choose to, to put one out on the floor. And I think that's fine. We can, we can take it as it comes and we can work uh, the bills that way. But I just don't, I don't, I would not feel comfortable sponsoring these bills as a committee right now. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Landon. I think you're, please know, commit colleagues. I knew that this would be the feedback I'd get today. Um, however, um, the question is right now, and the way I you know, really thought, don't do anything, let this lie. But right now we'll let the executive branch and the judicial branch, if there's a lawsuit, pick whether or not there's expansion rather than as a legislature making that decision on our own. Um, and if people are comfortable with that, then that's fine. As a legislator who likes to set policy, I think that that's our job. So maybe we don't take any action today, but this is an unresolved issue, one that's percolating and one that we haven't figured out yet. Uh, Senator Guru. With that, I would make a motion to table both these bills. I believe that's, is that an undebatable motion? Yes. It's an undebatable motion. Um, all those in favor of tabling this bill right now, please raise your hand. I don't think we take a vote, do we? On a motion? I, well. I think we need to just at least take a vote. One, two, three. I can't see the full screen, so OSO. Twelve eyes. Twelve eyes to table. Those opposed, raise your hands. Just one. Thank you, committee members. Also in your meeting materials, just so you're aware, you'll see a couple of amendments. Um, you know, as this issue continues to percolate, I do have substantial concerns that the commission isn't prohibited from playing the games it regulates. At our last hearing, we heard um, testimony from the lottery um, folks saying that their board members, including their immediate family members, are prohibited from playing any lottery games, which they regulate. And that issue has come before our commission, and they've denied to take action on it. So I do think we need to provide some clarity there. Another issue, issue that's percolated is the fact that we do require fingerprinting and some background work that falls on the shoulders of our Division of Criminal Investigations. Right now, they don't have a funding mechanism for that increased workload. And so I think that we do owe it to our um, DCI and the commission to give them some rulemaking authority to um, cover the cost of doing that work. And um, you know, would urge management council um, to give us a little more latitude in the future so that we're not caught at the 11th hour trying to put together something that makes sense. I think a better preference would be for us to look at our gaming statutes in their entirety. A lot has been noted about the fact that things have changed pretty dynamically over the last 10 years in gaming from the authorization of historic horse racing games, from the inclusion of lottery, now we've got online sports wagering and now skill games. And there are some, I think, conflicting definitions um, within those statutes that don't make sense. You know, For some of those games, you only have to be 18 to play them, others 21. And so there needs to be, I think, some effort to provide somewhat of a level playing field among these various gaming entities so that they're competing apples to apples under a, a fair regulatory structure. Um, so that would be my plea to those of management council who I'm sure are watching this extraordinary hearing today. Um, and I want the committee to know that it is, I knew, I had a feeling that this is how the discussion would go today, but I also felt it compelled to put it out on the record. Um, the word that the, the words I used in talking about Senate file 56 last year. Um, and I know that that came together quickly, but at the end of the day, I didn't feel comfortable moving together, moving ahead with a, um, allowing these games in without assuring that we weren't allowing criminals with people, known criminal backgrounds to have access to playing these games. And so um, I just think we've got a lot more thinking to do to make sure we're incorporating best industry practices as we continue to grow our gaming economy. So with that committee members, we've reached the end of our hearing. Um, since we took no action, I don't think there's any need for public comment. Um, I think staff uh, has just to make sure, LSO, if you wanted to, um, Recap, next steps forward. 
Um, I think we had some additional information items we were going to try and get out to people. And then uh, the passage of the uh, film incentive bill, Representative Flitner and I will decide which chamber to start that one in. LSO, did you have anything else you wanted to offer on your to-do list? Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, we have a few follow-ups that we'll, we'll conduct offline with uh, tourism uh, and the Gaming Commission. Um, as you mentioned, the uh, film incentives bill as amended uh, was sponsored by the committee. And then just one thing to note, I, I believe Senator Guru had uh, raised his hand again and uh, may want to speak again. Oh, I apologize. That to your discretion. Senator Guru. Thank you, Madam Chair. And not to belabor this, but I, I want to, you know, I want to make sure you understand very, very clearly. I, and I'm just speaking for myself, but I bet I might be speaking for a couple others here. Um, I totally agree that we've got some issues here. Um, we've asked our, the Paramutual Commission to take on a Herculean task over the last year, or last couple of years with these skill games, sports wagering and all. And all. This the whole situation cries out for some resolution. And believe me, no one is in favor uh, I, that I know of is in favor of, of you know, doing anything but having the best practices and doing the best we can. My motion today was merely on a process point and wanting to be and wanting our, you know, wanting to hear from everyone about how these issues come out. And so if this comes forward as a private bill, I look forward to a full airing of this. And before I get thrown off of the management council, which um, was a vote that was taken by the body, um, I've got one more meeting and I will take your message to that group and say, and, and say that we need to allow this group to maybe spend some more time on this issue in the, in the following interim. So uh, just wanted to make sure you knew that. I, I really do. This That vote was not, at least in my mind, a vote not to do any of those things that, that you wanted to do and make that real clear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Gruen. I, I can't disagree with you um, at all. If, if, on other committees, we have to adhere to our process. If we don't adhere to our process, then what else have we got? Um, I think because the circumstances of this have been so extraordinary, I just wanted to at least get this on your radar. And um, now we've got two bill ideas and we can visit offline colleagues if any of you have an interest in providing some clarity over whether or not we intended to expand or not, then we can um, pick that up and I welcome your feedback, I really do. And um, at the end of the day, I don't support, or I don't, I'm not objected to the notion of expanding the number of games. I think having people being able to compete and letting the market decide that, there's nothing wrong with that in my mind. My problem is that should be a decision that we as a legislature makes, not an oops, we accidentally expanded it. Senator Landon. Madam Chairman, thank you for those thoughts and um, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, agree wholeheartedly. And um, I can't speak as eloquently as Senator Daru, but um, ditto to what he indicated. Um, you know, my vote today was simply regarding process and not so much the importance of, of the issue. And it, if, those, if those bills arrive and the leadership of either chamber chooses to get them out on the floor and we can get them in, uh, I look forward to working with all of you uh, to make that legislation as good as it can be. So uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, colleagues. And um, I would ask from now until February 14th, let's have a conversation. Please reach out. Let me know where you land. Do you want to expand or not? Um, I do have concerns about, as I mentioned, members of our commission playing games that they regulate. I don't think that's okay. I have concerns about DCI covering the cost of doing background checks, fingerprints, that kind of thing. Those are issues we need to probably resolve sooner rather than later. So um, there's ideas out there of how we can resolve this, but um, private bills, February 14th, we'll see how, where, we, where we end up on some of this. Thank you committee members. With that, we're adjourned.